button to speak, you can't speak directly to the microphone. If it's lit, you're on. Thank you. The button to speak, you can't speak directly to the microphone. If it's lit, you're on. So again, welcome everyone. Um, I reminded our two uh, community representatives, uh, Angela and Andrew, that when speaking, obviously everyone's, everyone's speaking to the mic to make sure Maria can hear us. Uh, Elliot, who's the director of technology is just needing a minute or two to make sure that the live stream is all set up. We also have our district clerk, Betty Campy, uh, who is not here. She is also remote tonight. She'll be watching the video and taking minutes. So. It's always important that we have the live, the live stream and the video set up properly, but tonight is particularly important. Stream is working. I think we should uh, we should get started, right, Elliot? You, you give us a thumbs up and you're ready for me to go. Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone who's watching this remotely, and of course everyone who's here tonight. Um, if you're watching remotely, of course the the uh, external audit committee of the North Shore uh, Board of Education uh, and district is made up of the seven trustees, but we also have two new community members who have volunteered. Uh, I should also mention we had many very qualified folks uh, from our community who wanted to step up and volunteer, for which we are most appreciative. Uh, and we did have to make some tough decisions, but we did choose two excellent members of the community to represent us, uh, Ms. Ms. Angela Levis. Levis, Levis? Leave us, all right. I should, I should have stuck with the first one. Uh, and then Andrew Spieler, which I know how to, how to pronounce, uh, are both here and we very much appreciate it. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Alan Yu from Colin Donowski to, uh, to present what he has tonight. Thank you. Is the light on? It is now. There you go. Okay, I have some uh, handout materials for um, the audit committee. Um, these are tentative draft documents um, just for a discuss discussion purposes only. And um, after this meeting, if you wouldn't mind, I would like to uh, collect them back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I do feel like we're in class. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 
I need a magnifying glass too. <laughs> it started, Marianne. It it's um I, I apologize for the small font. Um you may remember back in April um when I came before you in this audit committee uh, in, uh setting and explaining to you about Gatsby statement 84 becoming effective for this current fiscal year. So the effect of that is that there are three new uh, what we call miscellaneous special revenue funds that have been added to your district's reporting entity as part of your governmental funds. And you'll see them off to the right, right after the capital projects column, you see extra classroom activities, scholarships, and then student miscellaneous student activities. And those are um, now considered part of the governmental funds. And the result is the fonts became even, the, the, the page itself became even more compressed. Um, nevertheless, we feel that this is still the best, the better presentation. You can see all of the governmental funds on one page. And if you flip the page, you would see the same thing um, that has been done to the income statement. Okay, this is called a statement of revenues and expenditures and changes in fund balance. We'll, we'll call it the income statement for the governmental funds. Okay. But then when you flip the page, the, the third one, this is a supplementary schedule that is uh, for general fund only, and that's the requirement. Uh, governments are supposed to, are required by, by um, governmental accounting standards, GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, uh, to present a budget and actual comparison schedule uh, for any legally adopted budget, which of course you have one, and that is the general fund. Um, so this is this one is much easier to read. And the next page is the expenditures for the general fund budget and actual comparison. Okay. You flip the page again. Um, no, don't worry, I'm going to go back to those pages, of course. Um, the next page right after the budget and actual comparison of expenditures, uh, you, you will see a comparative table. Uh, that comparative table, Andrew, it's the uh, two pages later. Okay, just uh, just want to walk you through what what I'm going to be uh, discussing tonight. Okay, and and these comparative schedules are part of the management's discussions and and uh, analysis. When I come back here um, in 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 two weeks to present the full financial statements, you will see these tables within the MDNA section. Okay, so this is a snapshot of your governmental funds, fund balance or fund equity. Okay, and and this is in the in the financial statements. The management's discussions and analysis or MDNA section is the only set, is the only area that you will see a comparative uh, information being presented. Um, you will see at the top of 2020, um, we put down as restated, and it is because of the addition of the three new funds, extra classroom activities, scholarship, and student activity, activities funds because of GASB 84 again. And that's why uh, the information is considered as restated. Yes, Sarah. Can we, we have two new board members and two new audit committee members, and this is a very different format yes. than what we usually have. Could we, I know we have the handouts and people are very interested in them, but could we sort of just back up a minute and Absolutely. give a, just say, this is where we are and this is what we're doing kind right. of moment okay. versus, yes. thank you. I really appreciate it. No, no, of course, no problem at all. So uh, first of all, I do apologize for not being able to present to you a complete draft financial statements. Um, this is our sixth year of uh, being your external auditors. And, um, you know, for those of you who have been, um, you know, here for the past five years, and you know that you've always been able, we've always been able to present and provide you with a draft, with a draft set of financial statements and audit reports uh, in advance, uh, you know, days in advance of the audit committee meeting so that you would have time to uh, read, digest the information, excuse me, and formulate whatever questions you may have. Uh, this has been a, an extraordinary year uh, on a number of fronts. Um, for my firm, we have you know, significant personnel challenges. We've lost people to, fortunately not COVID, but relocation um, and um, to, to other to other industries, okay. Some of them went into school districts, okay. Uh, right. So it has been challenging, and um, because what because of what we do is so unique and is such a niche, 
that uh, you, know, you cannot find, we cannot find people in the open market that has the kind of qualification that we need in order to perform school districts and governmental accounting and auditing. And so we have to, you know, really just, just um, you know, pick up the slack and uh, more so partners like myself and senior level managers and even senior level managers, we lost two of them, one to relocation and one to, uh, you know, to industry, to a school district. So, you know, they, they always happened at the most inopportune time. Um, and so, you know, that has been a setback, unfortunately, uh, as far as scheduling and staffing. Um, and then at the same time, uh, of course, at, at, at your business office, as you know, your longtime assistant business, business manager also retired in December, and you have uh, your new school district auditor um, coming on board. And as good as he is, you know, there is a, a um, learning, learning curve, um, as well as understanding what we are looking for as auditors. Um, so there's a bit of back and forth. Uh, we did have to reschedule the audit. Um, just so you know, we uh, you know we don't we didn't have to you know wait around for additional information. So once you start going down the rescheduling path, then things become even more complicated. But you know we managed to get through it. Thank you very much to Olivia and Yogesh. You know they've been very very cooperative. Uh, we utilize our portal a lot, um, and they've been they've been wonderful in terms of uh, being able to uh, well, willing to provide additional information. And as I said. Uh, you know, it's Yogesh, the, f the first time with Yogesh going through the audit with us. Uh, we do ask a lot of questions and we do ask for a lot of documentation. And it may, you know, to, to, to uh, Olivia is used to that and Jenna was used to that, but to, to someone new like Yogesh, you know, it, it probably at times seemed a little unreasonable, but, you know, we had our reasons we want our audit documentation. Um, and, but beyond the funds, okay, the governmental funds, which I'm going to go over, in a few minutes, um, there are other elements to the financial statements. Um, there are outside reports that you need um, in order to uh, for us to be able to present the, the, the complete financial statements. That's called a full accrual basis. Uh, for example, actuarial reports. Um, you you're self-insured for workers' compensation. Uh, that report did, didn't become available until last Friday. Okay, uh, that's a part of your financial statements. It, it, um, and there, there are also capital assets, and, and that's, but this year for some reason it's been, it's been an issue for many school districts in terms of the capital assets. It's, it's sometimes it's the capital assets management company. In this case, you use a software in-house, uh, but it's it's similar in that because it's not something that's a part of your, uh, part of a school district's normal routine that that they're required to do on a monthly basis. It's usually done at fiscal year end, after everything else is done. Um, and then, and then there's a reconciliation process. If something doesn't make sense, we go back and forth. You need to add this. You need to subtract that. So there's also a wait time on that. And um, so the capital assets reports, we we have a final version two days ago. Okay. So it it unfortunately it's it's not like we can take all the information. Okay, you give it to us. We can just spit out our financial statements the next day. It it takes time. Plus, we have our internal uh, quality control process. Uh, I didn't feel comfortable to try to rush a draft document out to meet in order to meet with you um, if it has not been quality control reviewed by our department yet. And we have uh, three levels of internal review um, before it becomes a final product. Uh, so it's it's a variety of reasons and. Like I said, you know, this is the first time ever, and I don't expect to see a repeat performance. Okay, and, and we can't do that. Um, so, my apologies. Okay, uh, typically uh, we would provide the documents the weekend before um, or Monday the latest, Monday before the board meeting the latest, so that you would have uh, ample time to review them. So, thank you for the detailed description. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so then going on um, uh, the, um, the schedules, as I said earlier, I was talking about the, the, the MDNA schedule, the two-year comparative information um, is as restated because of new funds being added. Um, the next schedule is, would be also in um, part of the MDNA, and this is a summary of the reserves activities, okay, the usage, as well as uh, fundings plus interest earnings. And then finally, the last page is 
even smaller fonts. It's the capital projects. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm going to talk to my um, web processing department, maybe at least break this into two pages, just to make the font size a little bigger when it, uh, you know, when it comes to the, uh, the final document. Okay. So that's, that's the overview, but you'll walk us through this in a narrative fashion. A absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. So Thank you. I wanna jump uh, right into the financial statements. Okay, uh, you, if you would go back to the first page of this handout. Okay, um, your district has a number of um, um, governmental funds, um, general fund, of course, the special aid fund, which is used to account for state and federal grants. Um, school food service fund, that's your cafeteria operations. Uh, that the debt service fund is a fund that is being used to uh, account for your bond debt service transactions. Uh, typically, what the district has been doing is in your annual budget, you provide for a transfer to the debt service fund, and then the debt service, service fund will recognize or record the principal and interest expenditures. So, but it's it's all really part of the school district's um, expenditures. Some school districts that do not utilize a debt service fund, um, instead of budgeting for a transfer out to the debt service fund, they would just budget for the, debt, the bond principal and interest repayment right in their general fund budget. So they are, the, they are equivalent. Okay. Uh, and then of course you have the capital projects fund. The funding sources for the capital projects fund are primarily uh, general fund appropriations in the form of operating transfer, budgeted operating transfers, from the general fund into the uh, capital projects fund. Uh, borrowings, uh, that's typically done by bonds. Um, occasionally you may have installment purchase debt such as energy performance contract that would be considered a form of uh, long-term uh, borrowing as well. And so when that happens, uh, that would become uh, reported uh, in that last schedule that we saw earlier, but it will be reported through the capital projects fund. Okay. Uh, the extra classroom activities fund, that's the uh, student clubs money, um, scholarships or scholarships. And then we have uh, um, the last category of student activities. These are the you know, various miscellaneous um, funds, uh, including um, exam fees, uh, driver's ed, they, they all, these are all unrelated to your general fund operations. They are related to, to student activities because of the gas VAD and your district, by the way, has, uh, has a foresight of actually already having set up a separate uh, special revenue fund to account for these student activities so that it, it, it didn't become commingled with the general fund. So that was, that makes it a little bit easier when we, when it came to the uh, GASB statement 84 implementation. Okay. So uh, focusing, I, I want to focus on um, a few funds here, uh, general fund, of course, and then a school food service fund here, total assets in the, uh, for general fund 36.459 almost almost $36.5 million versus total liabilities of $11.2 million. We have deferred inflows of resources, including deferred revenues. Uh, LIFA pay their pilot uh, somehow in advance. So they pay for a portion of their 21-22 fiscal year pilot uh, obligation early, and that's the $2.3 million that's deferred revenue. Okay. Um, and that leaves you with a total fund balance of $22.6 million at the end of June 30th, 2021. And if you would, okay. if you would flip the page and go to second, go to the second page and look at the income statement for the general fund. Total actual revenues received from uh, outside sources, okay, including uh, property taxes, payment in lieu of taxes, and the star rate reimbursement from New York State, uh, total $107.7 million. That's again, the first column, okay. Total uh, expenditures before operating transfers out, was almost $106 million. And then including the operating transfers out, uh, which as I mentioned earlier, um, included the debt service requirement. In this case, the 5,118 of operating transfers out was made up of $115,000 transferred to the special aid fund. That's the district's required 
estimated 20% funding for the summer program for students with, with disabilities. Uh, that is that program, those program expenditures are accounted for in the special aid fund. Um, the, the New York state would pay for 80% of eligible uh, costs and district's general fund has to pick up the uh, remainder, which is uh, roughly about 20%. That's $115,000. The transfer to the debt service was 3,284,000 and change. Um, the actual required bond principal interest payment was, as you can see up uh, a little bit uh, above it, total $3,334,000. So, so the district actually used about $50,000 of existing debt service fund towards um, uh, paying the, uh, the required annual debt service payment. Okay. Um, also, there was a budgeted transfer from the general fund into the capital projects fund in the amount of $1,719,000. Okay. Uh, that's used to fund um, several new capital projects that were uh, 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 delineated, uh, that was itemized in the, uh, in the annual adopted budget. Okay. So uh, in total, uh, that brings your general fund um, to have a decrease, overall decrease in total fund balance of $3,345,000. So, so it, 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 it actually reflects the uh, district's planned use of fund balance, right? In this case, total expenditures, including operating transfers out, uh, is a little over $111 million uh, versus revenues of, uh, of $107 million, okay? And that's where you have the net change or net decrease of $3,345,000. Um, but in terms of, that number, okay, that reflects, as I said, planned use of fund balance, okay? And that's the nature of appropriate fund balance when the, when, when the school board put appropriate fund balance in their annual budget, you know, that's uh, including, uh, in this case, you have the $2.7 million and $200,000 from last year, which you have uh, earmarked for safe reopening of schools and staff development for uh, um, remote learning. Uh, that's what that really means that you're using you go you're going to use fund balance to pay for these expen expenditures rather than outside revenues and so um, this is basically a reflection of that planned use of fund balance okay so the end result is general fund total fund balance decreased to 22.6 million dollars so let's go back to the first page please oh Okay, so the fund balance of the general fund is composed of a number of items. Okay, uh, we have non-spendable, one hundred seventy-nine thousand, almost one hundred seventy-eight, uh, almost one hundred eighty thousand dollars. I'll get back to that um, in a couple of minutes. Then you have the various restricted reserve, uh, reserves, workers' compensation, unemployment, retirement contribution reserve for TRS and the ERS. Uh, liability reserve, employee benefit accrued liability reserve, which is used to pay for uh, compensated absences payout, uh, capital reserve, and repairs reserve. Okay, and then uh, in the assigned fund balance category, uh, we have 1.98 million dollars. That's in your 21-22 fiscal year budget um, as appropriated to towards some um, expenditures. The special designation of LIPA money, that's the, of course, the ongoing uh, uh, balance that the, the district has been spending down over the past um, six or seven years um, that originated from the, the uh, two special legislative grants that the district received several years ago, plus the uh, liquidation of the tax social reserve. Um, and this is the, uh, uh, the balance that's remaining that the district has been over time every year um, taking money out of that um, special designation um, of board earmarks uh, towards, um, towards the, the annual budgets. The assigned unappropriated fund balance, that's the open purchase orders or open encumbrances um, that were left at the end of uh, June 30th, 2021. Um, those are commitments or purchase, purchases, purchase orders that have been issued to uh, vendors, um, but for which uh, they, the services or the goods have not, the goods have not been delivered yet. Um, and those will then become 
when they are received in the next fiscal year or in the 21-22 fiscal year, they will then become the expenditures of the uh, fiscal year, leaving you with an unassigned fund balance of $4.67 million. If you would now go to this schedule, the two-year comparative schedule, okay. I think it's about um, the fifth page, yes. So again, this is you know just focusing on a general fund for for the time being. You can see the uh, the net change uh, in the various uh, reserves category. Uh, the non-spendable advance, uh, one hundred seventy nine thousand dollars. I'll go to that right now. Uh, that came about because of the school food service fund. Uh, you will see that um, the school food service fund, uh, which is about the middle of the page, for the twenty twenty one fiscal year, it it actually ended up having. Um, an operating loss of about four hundred forty-three thousand uh, dollars. As a result, uh, there is an un unassigned fund deficit of one hundred seventy-nine thousand dollars. Because of that, uh, you know, governmental accounting rule requires us to uh, evaluate whether or not the interfund balance that general fund has that's that's receivable from the school food service fund, whether or not that could be re repaid within a short-term period. Okay, and the Interfund receivable from the school lunch fund actually is much more than it's more than one hundred seventy nine thousand um, dollars. But in in our evaluation, uh, we believe the proper amount to set aside as non spendable is just to the extent of the deficit, and not to uh, the extent of the full interfund receivable. Okay, um, that will be you know, later on. I'll talk about the uh, my 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 recommendation about um, that particular um, issue. And then workers, workers compensation, that the net decrease is uh, $269,000. You can see the various, various categories. Uh, in fact, if you flip the page, okay, um, you will see that the workers' compensation reserve, the unemployment insurance reserve, and the employee retirement system contribution reserves, uh, as well as the employee benefit accrued liability reserves, those were all utilized during the 2021 fiscal year. Uh, there are some interest earnings. Um, the $226 that you see uh, that was earned to the Workers' Common Employment Insurance and Repairs Reserve, that's a result of the tax anticipation notes borrowing. Uh, you might recall that the district actually borrowed from those reserves uh, rather than uh, having to go out to, uh, to the open market and borrow from a bank. And so uh, this is general fund repaying the interest to the Workers' Compensation Reserve, um, Unemployment and the Repairs Reserve. Um, and then the final funding decisions, um, which uh, the board ultimately approved, I believe, in um, at the July uh, <coughs> at the July uh, board resolution. Okay, the two hundred twenty-three thousand dollars being uh, refunded back to the unemployment insurance. That's because the district received uh, a refund uh, from the state. Um, the nine hundred forty-seven thousand uh, dollars contribution in uh, funding into the teachers' retirement system—that is exactly the maximum two percent allowed um, under the uh, the new the new laws calculation. Two percent of the previous year's TRS pensionable salaries. Um, the seven hundred ninety-five thousand nine hundred dollars into the capital reserve—that uh, was the uh, funding decisions that that uh, the board has um, has approved um, to use the year end surplus to fund this uh, four or five projects. I, I, I can't remember exactly. Uh, I'm sure Olivia does. Uh, and then the repairs reserve, and that was the return uh, of the funds from um, uh, that was spent in the prior years. Okay. So the takeaway from this is that yes, you have reserves, uh, but you also have been using it. And the um, and the funding uh, and the funding to the uh, TRS reserve and the capital reserve, um, you know, those were reasonable. Okay. Now, uh, please go back to the previous page. Okay. Uh, Andrew, you can uh, you can stay on that page, Andrew. Okay. So, um, so I've talked about the reserves and explained the uh, the net increase or decreases in the various categories. Uh, looking at the assigned fund balance, the appropriate fund balance amount, that's just your budget decision from year to year. For 21-22 fiscal year, your budget decision was to use 1980000 uh, 
uh, for appropriate fund balance as a funding source. Um, the reopening of the assigned for reopening of schools and professional development, the 2.7 million and the $200,000, those of course during the fiscal year, uh, the board has authorized the district to um, increase the budget and utilize that money. Right. And, and so it's, um, it's gone now. The, uh, as I said earlier, assigned unappropriated, that's the uh, year end encumbrances and leaving you with an unassigned fund balance of $4.67 million. Um, I, I've spoken about this in the past uh, and they, they have been in my uh, audit reports in the past as well. So for purposes of the um, uh, fund balance calculation for an assigned fund balance, uh, you do have to group the unassigned fund balance with the special designation of the LIPA money, okay, of the $1.15 million. So your total fund balance, uh, you're not going to have this information. I did not hand this out. I have my cheat sheet, which I looked back several years, just to give me an idea as far as, uh, you know, your, your fund balance, your total fund balance in relation to your spending. So total fund balance, we, we became your auditor uh, in 2016. And in 2016, your total fund balance as a percentage of expenditures were a little more than 32%, 32.3%. Uh, following year, uh, June 30, 2017, um, decreased to 31.5%. June 30, 2018, decreased to 26.5%. June 30, 19, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's it's slight increase, but it's still uh, about 26.7%. June 30, 2020, uh, it went down to 24.5%. And this year at $22.6 million, it's about 20.3% of your total expenditures. So it is a steady decline, um, but of course that is also, that is also, that has also been the plan of the school districts uh, to spend down the uh, special legislative grants um, over time. Alan, can I just ask a very quick question on that? Sure. So that's a decrease in the percentage of the overall expenditures, but that number stayed, it's had some ups and downs, but relatively flat. It's uh, the, it's as the budget's grown, that reserve number stayed the same. So as a percentage of the overall amount, it's lower, but the amount itself. Uh, right. The amount itself, uh, there's some years it's, it's up and down, um, but in, in uh, as far as in terms of the expenditures, the percentage is, is lowering. But just to give you an idea, uh, twenty six point seven million dollars at mm -hmm. June two thousand sixteen. Um, it went up to thirty point seven million dollars the next year, but the percentage dropped. Okay, it's thirty one and a half percent. So, um, but then in seventeen eighteen, it then went down to twenty seven point four million dollars. Uh, stayed at uh, twenty seven point four. Um, it's a slight increase, about eighty thousand dollars at the end of June 30, 2019. At June 30, 2020, uh, it decreased to 25.9 million, almost $26 million, and now to $22.6 million. Part of it has to do I with- I didn't know you had that ready. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but, but part of it has to do with that, the fact that um, you have, uh, the district has established a capital reserve with um, the approval of voters, okay? Um, this is an, an uh, you know, a, a, from a previous uh, budget year, uh, where there was, a, there was a proposition. So the district set established that reserve, you were able to fund the reserve, the capital reserve, and then there are some years where you were, uh, you have voters authorization to also spend from the capital reserve, okay? So when you have that, um, it became an expenditure of the general fund in order to uh, move it out of the capital reserve in the general fund into the capital projects fund where um, the, uh, the projects are being done. I said earlier, when, when I talked about the capital projects fund uh, very, very quickly, funding sources are general fund appropriations, borrowings, uh, bonds and uh, uh, installment debt, but also includes capital reserves and in your case, you did, you did have several projects that were funded with your repair reserves also, uh, which is in the general fund. Okay, so those are really the primary funding sources. And, and with capital reserve, that is the required accounting for it. And that's how, um, that's how the money gets out of the capital reserve that's, that's, um, that is funded in the general fund uh, to be utilized for capital projects. So, 
so in terms of the, um, I'd like to go to, uh, to talk about um, the, the expenditures uh, versus the revenues uh, on the second page of the handout. Total revenues this year um, at $107.7 million. Uh, it's an increase of about $3.3 million compared to the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Um, and um, the, uh, the most of the increase came from uh, tax revenues as well as uh, pilot money. Okay. Uh, the, the star A reimbursement from, the, from New York State actually went down compared to the, to, compared to the previous fiscal year. And um, it, it actually has been, um, you know, it has been going up until the uh, this current fiscal year, where the uh, the contribution, excuse me, it has been steadily decreasing the star A reimbursement. So, uh, where the star A reimbursement from the state is decreasing, the tax levy or the net tax levy would have to increase, of course. Uh, Non-tax revenue uh, was a net increase of about um, two hundred seventy-five thousand uh, dollars. Basically, state aid did increase, and as you know, you had some uh, CARES Act funding from the federal government. That's roughly about eighty-three thousand dollars. But there was also a significant drop in interest earnings um, by more than five hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. That we're seeing it across the board at all levels of governments because of much, much lower interest uh, interest rates. And the expenditures in total, um, including the transfers, were $111 million. So 105.9 plus the 5 million 118 transfer. Um, so that translated into a net increase of $5.1 million compared to the previous year's total expenditures. Okay. Uh, salaries went up uh, by the most at $4 million. It's, the two usual suspects, okay, salaries and related employee benefits. Uh, for this past fiscal year, your salaries went up, um, you know, quite a, quite a bit, um, little, uh, almost 7%. And a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, COVID, it's COVID-19 related um, because of um, the, the district's reopening plan, um, class size was reduced. And in order to accommodate that, the district, I understand the district had to hire additional staff um, there's also additional uh, uh, pay, payroll costs for security because of um, you know outdoor learnings and you have tents set up. Okay, so uh, some of the <laughs> excuse me, and of course you settled the uh, teacher's contract. Okay, their contract expired as of June 30, 2020, and you're able to settle the contract before the fiscal year, and therefore uh, you know you had the true cost of the true cost of the increase also uh, uh, included in the uh, in the salary. Uh, salary increase. The total employee benefits went up by $1.1 million. Uh, the biggest ones being uh, TRS contribution. Uh, that's a factor of the higher contribution rates from TRS from New York State, as well as higher salaries. Um, also, uh, as a result, FICA, uh, payroll tax, social security taxes, um, the employer share, uh, that also went up by about $560,000. Okay, unemployment insurance expenditure did go up, but as we saw earlier, as I talked about earlier, uh, you did receive a refund from New York State, and that went back into the into the reserve. Okay. Uh, workers' compensation expenditures went up by about ninety five thousand dollars compared to a year ago. So all told, between the two categories, four million dollars of salaries and a million dollars in employee benefits, um, that uh, accounted for. Um, you know, a bulk of the changes. However, there are additional changes um, and there are also decreases. Um, the transfer to capital fund actually went down uh, in the number that I gave you the $111 million, as I said, included transfer to capital fund. Uh, last year's transfer to capital fund was much higher, $4.6 million, because it included the transfer out of the capital reserve into the capital projects fund. Uh, so that drop alone was two point, almost $2.9 million. So the, the true increase, actually non-capital related increase in expenditures is actually close to $8 million. Uh, so in addition to the salary costs, uh, there are also additional costs 
um, related to COVID-19 uh, responses, uh, reopening schools safely. Uh, you have, of course, of course, additional expenditures uh, for ventilation, um, for uh, buying outdoor tents for outdoor classrooms. Um, also, your transportation costs went back up compared to a year ago. Of course, last year, 1920 was the anomaly. Uh, so now we're seeing the, the expansions coming back to uh, uh, the level um, that was close to where, where they used to be. Um, okay, uh, legal expenditures actually went up significantly, uh, went up by half a million dollars compared to a year ago. Okay, that's, that's um, actually more than doubled. Um, also, there is a uh, the, an increase in into in the uh, special education costs. Okay, again, a comp this is compared to last year, and so this is really more. Uh, although the costing the expenses increase, it's more rebounding back to the level that it used to be. Okay. Uh, computer instructional media that went up um, also by about um, two hundred and. Um, $85,000, okay. A lot of it has to do with the purchases of Chromebooks, okay. Uh, we have actually one category that decreased, uh, it's a transfer to the uh, school food service fund. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll go right into it. Uh, to, in 2019, 2020, uh, the, the, the board authorized a one-time transfer of $200,000 to the school food service fund. That was because of the uh, then governor's mandate or the state's mandate to for school districts to continue to provide meals and um, the, the school lunch fund really couldn't uh, couldn't have sustained it and so the board authorized the two hundred thousand dollars transfer that did not happen this year okay so if we now look at the uh, income statement for the school food service fund please that's the second page of the handout the third column Okay. You will see that the uh, total school food service revenue is $940,000 as compared to the uh, total expenditures of $1.38 million. Now, um, it, it's interesting. I, I look back at uh, the financial statements from the last several years. Um, the Really, the issue with the school lunch fund this year, school food service fund this year, which of course, as I said earlier, had a four hundred forty-three thousand uh, dollar operating loss. Uh, the issue is really with the revenue side. Okay, the expenditures over the past several years have been quite steady at about one point three, one point four million dollars over the last several years. Um, you know, just to give you an idea, uh, total school food service revenue from nineteen twenty, which has been cut short was $1.1 million. And in 2019, 1819, total revenues were $1.5 million. And the bulk of it came from sales, food sales, okay? Um, until then, you were not getting a lot of federal uh, reimbursements or state reimbursements. Um, but because of COVID-19 for 2020-21 fiscal year, and now in 21-22 fiscal year as well, uh, the state or the federal government is picking up a tab. Everybody's getting free meals, as you know. Um, so that does increase, that did increase the federal reimbursement. So you're looking at $700,000 of federal sources of revenue in the school food service fund. Okay. Um, that is, that is uh, you know, quite a bit of increase from compared to a year ago, uh, but it doesn't cover the loss in sales. Uh, you have $215,000 this year, but last year it was $886,000. And in 1819 fiscal year, it was over a million dollars in, in terms of, um, excuse me, in 1819, it was actually $1.3 million in sales. So that's a big decrease, okay? And that year, 1819, your federal revenue was only $218,000, okay? So while well, yes, you got more money from federal, from federal sources, from federal reimbursement, uh, it doesn't quite cover the loss in, uh, the loss in revenue from sales, and I understand that there's a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, sales would be from snacks. The loss the loss of sales would be in snacks, and also um, for 2021 fiscal year, your high school was more of a hybrid model. Uh, they were not full time, unlike K through eight, and um, and also there were limitations of uh, the variety of food that were made made available. So all those factored into your 
uh, loss in revenue. Um, so nevertheless, um, your school food service fund is supposed to run uh, you know, as a not-for-profit and federal government requires that uh, your, your school food service fund uh, to not have a, if you have a deficit, you have to find resources to cover that deficit. Okay, um, so you know, in, in my management letter comments, I I I I talk about uh, the fact that you had a deficit, um, and the fact that federal government requires you to provide for for resources to cover that deficit. So the best way to do it is actually through the budgeting process. Um, in 21-22, of course, you do not have a line item to transfer into the school food service fund. Okay, you, you don't do that you, you, because you didn't have to. Okay, you, you, for all those years, you didn't have to. Um, last year was the first time and it was, it was because of a state mandate. Um, and then for, for now, you, you have this deficit. So how do you cover it? Uh, the answer is you provide from the general fund, but how do you do it? Can you use a board, can you do a board uh, resolution to authorize the transfer? Um, it, I think it depends. Okay, it, it depends, and, and you would have to really consult with school attorneys on that, um, because they are conflicting information, um, even from the from the SED's guidance. Uh, it seems to suggest, on one hand, that it's a contingent expenditure, and then on the other hand, seems to suggest that, that you need to build that into your annual budget. So the best way to provide for it is through the uh, annual budgeting process. And in fact, you know, if this continues for for this current fiscal year that we're in, 21-22 fiscal year. Uh, you may very well continue to have another operating deficit uh, that you would have to um, build that into your 22-23 budget decisions. I just, uh, we have about probably 10, 15 minutes left. I want to make sure we give uh, give folks an opportunity to either ask questions about what you presented today mm -hmm. or questions about what's coming up for in two weeks when we have the final report. Sure. Okay. I think you're. I think you're. You're nearing the end of the summary because I know. I, I am. Yeah, okay. Good. Right. Yes, I am. Good. And then uh, you know that, that those two really are the primary funds I want to cover. Uh, I already talked about the debt service fund, the transfer being uh, from the general fund being three point two eight million dollars, the actual uh, bond bond and, and uh, bond principal and interest or debt service requirements were three point three million dollars, um, and so you you spend down your available fund balance in the debt service fund towards um, paying off that service, okay? Um, as far as the capital projects fund is concerned, um, you know, you have issued a bond uh, this year, okay? So the accounting of it is, uh, that's the, uh, the $39 million bond uh, proposition that was um, authorized last year. So when you issue bond, that becomes a revenue source or a funding source, okay? Um, that's $13.5 million. Uh, with the uh, the setup of the of the of the of the bond, uh, you actually have to utilize the premium that you receive towards the capital construction as well. That's one point six eight million dollars, uh, including the budgeted transfer from the general fund to to, to fund for other non bond related projects. The total increase or or intake or other funding sources, as we call it in governmental accounting, is sixteen point nine six million dollars, and you continue to um, to uh, 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 to uh, uh, <laughs> incur capital construction expenditures of uh, from five point one million dollars. Your capital construction activities continue, okay, and that's in that last page. If you have, um, you know, if you're interested, you can see the um, the, uh, the the various projects that have um, that have incurred the expenditures. So um, I, I actually in this in this schedule here, I have. Um, Rearrange the the layout a little bit so that I you know so that the, the projects are now grouped by funding sources. I, I think it would be a little bit easier for uh, you know certainly for 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 me um, to identify which projects were funded by what funding sources. Uh, so what I want to point out to you because it was in my last year's uh, management letter comment was about certain projects that appear to have been uh, completed um, because there have been no activities uh, before which there were some. Uh, unexpended balances. And, and what I was referring to were projects that were funded with general fund appropriations. So that's the second group there. Okay. The, um, and uh, the amount that, that I identified last year um, 
you know, and, and I probably should have put it down in, in my management letter comments to be more clear about that. But it's, uh, you know, uh, more than $200,000 worth of capital projects. So my recommendation last year to the uh, district was to uh, review the status of capital projects and which actually at the time they were already performing that um, and uh, make a decision as to what to do with the money. And uh, that has been done. I saw in your 22, 20, uh, 20, 223 fiscal 2122 excuse me 2122 fiscal year budget that there's a, a $253,000 of transfer back from the capital projects fund in back to the general fund that is exactly how I would recommend that school districts do and in fact that's how many school districts are doing it uh, that way it's it's in the budget it's it's part of your budget deliberation process so that would take care of uh, you know several of the um, older completed projects under the general fund appropriations. The um, bond projects from the 2012-2013 bond proposition, uh, the, left, the leftover balance is roughly about 590. 500, thank you, thank you. So that, um, I understand that that has already, you know, there are already two, two projects um, that fit the uh, scope of the bond proposition that the district will, uh, utilize the um, the bond money, the leftover bond money from from that proposition to to complete, uh, and then there are the capital reserves um, as well as the repair reserves. So the repair reserves funded project. Um, in speaking with management, I understand that the plan is to at some point in in the uh, this fiscal year, um, administration will uh, most likely recommend to the board to. Uh, to authorize the transfer back into the repair reserve that resides in the general fund so that that can be repurposed for, for other uh, repairs projects. And then there are the capital reserves. So the capital reserves, um, you know, you, the, the projects, uh, the fundings that, that are sitting in the capital projects fund were previously authorized by voters. So you continue to spend it until all of the uh, requested projects are completed. So that will be an ongoing process um, you know, for, for the business office to continue to monitor. Okay, so uh, as far as the, uh, my, my comments last year regarding the completed capital projects, uh, I'm glad to see that it has been addressed. Thank you, Alan. No, you're Thank welcome. You. Uh, uh, questions? Yeah, trustees, uh, members of the committee, anyone have any questions? Again. Sure, Angela. Sure. The, you, yeah, sure, just make sure the light is on and you're into okay. the mic. Very good. Um, small question on the food uh, sales. You said you mentioned that there was a. I was just going to go right. Yeah, okay. go right into it. Can you the, hear me? Okay. Oh, that's so much better. Yeah. Thank you. On the food um, portion of the uh, chart, you mentioned that there was a decrease in revenue uh, that was partially offset by an increase uh, of uh, reimbursement from the government. Um, was there a cost reduction as well that uh, we were able to see on the numbers or no? To there, 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 no, um, as I, I mentioned uh, briefly, the, the costs have been actually relatively uh, stable, stable. Okay. Uh, one of the main reasons is that you have your own uh, cafeteria personnel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So that's always uh, a cost driver, okay, because you have salaries and you have employee benefits. And as we all know, salaries continue to go up so, contractually, right. so do benefits. Okay. okay. And then one more question. Um, you mentioned that salaries went up uh, partially due to a salary increase and also an increase in uh, new hires. Is that a permanent or a temporary hire? So do we know, I don't know if that's a question. Well, that's not a question for me then. Right, that right, would be that yeah, for administration. I think, I think Olivia can answer that yes, question. Yes, I think. Uh, this was because of the pandemic, we had to bring in a lot of new staff last year mm -hmm. and social distance kids in the classroom. Right. So most of those positions were one year position. Dr. Dr. Z can talk about that. And at the end of the 2021 school year, most of those people were left off okay. because okay. of that. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's all the questions I have for now. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Alan, the only thing I was curious about is you mentioned in terms of the shortfall, we had a surplus in the reserve for the food service for a few years, and that was great, but it does show, poof, 
where it can go when something like like this happens uh, from the lack of those sales. The temporal progression where you have in 2021, you have this unexpected shortfall. But by the time we officially have audits for that, and we recognize the entirety of it, of course, our voters have already approved our 21-22 budget within which we're living now. Right. So we certainly could plan to budget for that in 22-23, but that's far off and we're living with their shortfall. So how do you manage that when, because these things are voter approved and you need, I mean, we had, the board adopts a budget in March to present to the community. This is all, especially in the world of COVID where these free, quote right. unquote free, because the quote unquote free meals they're free to parents and free to families. Right. But of course, from the district's perspective, it doesn't matter whether it's coming out of a parent's pocket or it's coming out of Uncle Sam's pocket. It's still just revenue for these for these food programs that we're getting. Right. And as you've mentioned, we're getting less because they're not, they're just getting the meal. They're not buying snacks and extra drinks and all, all the Can rest I add of that. one thing right. to that? Yeah. It's not just that. It's that the reimbursement rate is significantly lower than yes. what people would typically pay for lunch, right? Our lunch is a very reasonable price. It's right. $3.50. We cook it from scratch. It's very healthy. The federal government is not giving you $3.50. So for the country overall, right, to make everyone's lunch free was just a tremendous benefit and the right thing to do. But we're in a very strange situation where a tiny portion of our students previously got for a reduced lunch relative to the rest of the country. And so, and we live in a very high cost area, right? And those are, na the national reimbursement rates are, are national. And for the record, like you mentioned, we've chosen lunches that are healthier and, you know, more local and are, uh, I mean, Olivia, you've talked about this a lot. And there, there is a silver lining to that that I was going to bring up later that I want to mention. These you can see all over the news, there are very significant shortages of food for school lunches. But it turns out that a lot of that is because schools can't purchase the highly processed foods that they normally bought, the crustables, the pizzas with the frozen pizzas with the 60 ingredients. They can't get those foods anymore because of the supply chain issues and labor market issues that are going on with factories that are producing those foods. Right. While we're not immune to supply chain issues, we are miraculously insulated from some severe food shortages other people see because a dozen years ago, Olivia, she didn't just build the bus depot, moved us away from processed foods to this model. Natural. And you can get real food still, but it costs more than the federal government wants to give you. But thank you, Olivia. We yeah. appreciate it. Okay. So uh, it is 7.45. Any other questions? We could take them now or... I want to say, Alan, I appreciate your uh, mea culpa in terms of the timing and all that. It was uh, heartfelt, and I have been in this board five or six years, that five and a half plus years, and uh, certainly the first time experienced this way. So I appreciate you saying that. Uh, it certainly was, you know, something we discussed. But I will now turn the table and say the silver lining is that we did do a deeper dive into the balance sheets and the and the and the, uh, the income statements that we normally would do all right so i appreciate that and it is instructive especially for new folks and for the uh the, the uh our newer trustees so i thank you for that and i look forward to seeing you in two weeks with the full report you're, you're welcome uh would you like me to stay or i think at this point we're going to go to a regular meeting it's certainly okay. open to the whole public but it's uh okay depends all right some okay. people find it scintillating some people not so much so <laughs> thank right, you. Right. but you do want to collect these back yes thank yeah. you Thanks, thank Alan. you Alan, and we do look forward to getting to see you again yeah thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, and I'm sorry for all the questions. <laughs> no, no. We appreciate the question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> It makes sense with all the food shortage and everything that's going on in inflation. Right. <laughs> you know, because it's like, hey, that's true. Okay, we had a um, we had a uh, our executive session, then our audit meeting tonight. So we've been here a little while. So we just have a, a short little personal privilege moment, and then we'll get right back to it. Although everyone's here, so there you go. It's an empty chair, but we're all we're all back. So that was brief. Uh, I want to welcome everyone tonight. Please know that the board met in executive session to consider matters regarding collective negotiations pursuant to Article Four of the civil service law and the employment promotion, demotion or dismissal of a particular person or persons. Uh, with that, I would like to call the meeting to order and ask everyone to please rise so we can say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first action is to approve the minutes of our meeting in public on October 21. Is there a motion? Motion. And a second. Thank you. Any questions or comments on, the, on those minutes? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, tonight, you may have noticed a small difference from our regular meetings, uh, which is that our interim superintendent, Dr. Dolan, is in Washington, D.C. tonight with our 
away with our high school principal, Eric Contreras, and the head of our teachers union, Greg Perlis, to receive the blue ribbon from the Department of Education for this building in which we are sitting. So we are most proud of them for that and proud as a district. Tonight we have Dr. Crit. I'm sorry, can you pronounce your name? I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Zublionis, with whom many, of course, are quite familiar, uh, who will be filling in for uh, for Dr. Dolan tonight, and I'll hand it over to you for the superintendent's report. I had this dream I could borrow his name for one night because it's yeah. got two syllable name, which is terrific. But um, yes, it's uh, my pleasure to be with you this evening uh, for Dr. Dolan. We're Dolanless tonight, um, but uh, we have some great updates for you. Um, very proud of our athletics teams and uh, what they've been doing. Uh, women's ten tennis, women's soccer, men's soccer competing in the playoffs. Uh, boss boys cross country finished fifth in the in the county championships, but junior Sam Sturge finished first. Um, our women's cross country team finished second in the county championships, and women's volleyball is still in it. They're playing. They just defeated Locust Valley, and they're in the county semifinals against Seaford on Saturday. And football will play their first uh, playoff game against Malvern on Saturday as well. Uh, women's swimming actually begins uh, the playoff this week. And believe it or not, I was talking to uh, Mr. Ficini uh, today, and wrestling and winter sports are about to start. Um, coming up on November 19th, our uh, fine performing arts uh, high school massacres presentation of the curious incident of the dog in the in the nighttime on Friday, November 19th at 7.30 p.m. and Saturday on the 20th at 2 and 7.30 p.m. Uh, and you can t uh, purchase tickets at uh, nshsmaskers.org. Um, um, last week, we had Red Ribbon Week and we had activities and lessons and presentations in all of our buildings and our PE and health classes. We had great presentations um, from speakers, uh, Matt uh, Balas, uh, who spoke to eighth graders and all of our high school students. Um, we had presentations from uh, LICAD and uh, with our fifth graders on vaping. Um, the um, Actually, the Friday before Red Ribbon Week on the 22nd, we had an E3 day with our middle school that was focused on health and wellness. Uh, and we had some speakers there as well. Um, a high school provided me with some great academic updates for some of the work that they're doing. Um, intermediate science research students are coming up uh, with ideas for carbon neutral cruise ships, uh, treatment for sickle cell anemia, and wildfire prevention systems. Um, the IB Theory of Knowledge course is running exhibitions. Um, students presented how theory of knowledge manifests in the world around them. Um, our high school Spanish teachers in the World Language Department celebrated and shared Hispanic Heritage Month by inviting all students to participate in trivia, scavenger hunts, and impromptu salsa competitions. The ninth grade research labs are conducting their first end of quarter conference reflections in the new school year, and students set personalized goal that, goals that combine study skills, research skills, and worked along the SVOs and IB learner profile. Very interesting, our advanced photography class is resuming for the first time since COVID photo field trips. One such trip to the Captree Boat Station inspired students to uh, create firsthand uh, experiential art. Um, and in our elementary schools, the return of our Halloween parades was great this past mm -hmm. week. Um, also in addition, um, all of our schools participated in Unity Day. Uh, they're expanding their clubs and their intramurals. So on that front, we feel like life is getting back to a, to a pre-COVID uh, experience for students in that way. Um, one thing I did want to mention is you might have noticed, especially our Glenhead folks, that there was a sinkhole that developed in the Glenhead School after the big rainstorm last week. Um, John Hall and the maintenance department is working actively on that. They're working with engineers. Uh, it seems that these are dry wells. Uh, that did collapse from the, from the storm. Um, they have to excavate the chain of four or five dry wells, repair the tops, and then they'll have to look at the drainage and backfill that system. So that work is in process and we'll have a report at the end of the week on that. Uh, one other thing I do wanna mention is we're hearing in the schools on some of the community, uh, parts of the community that there is a requirement for vaccination that's gonna be coming in next week. And I just wanted to let everybody know that we have not heard about that from the state or from any governing body. Um, we know things are happening in other states, but you know we are not aware of that in any way. So I just wanted to, to let everybody know that and uh, clarify that as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Zuplionis. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, I will offer a brief report on the status of our search for our next superintendent. 
as I mentioned at our last meeting, we had many community outreach sessions uh, that were well attended. We had our survey results, which was also well filled out, uh, but has now since closed. And the board just yesterday received the report from our consultants, which went through all the information, synthesized the feedback that we had received, which was quite voluminous. Uh, I thank the community for all your feedback and for letting us know what you felt. Uh, it's partly numerical, partly uh, commentary. So we will all read that and uh, get a better understanding. The next step will be the board will meet next week with our consultants to finalize the profile, which will be approved and adopted at our 18th of November meeting. And that will become the, the, the central document that is used to recruit and bring on candidates for the position itself. So we're looking forward to that. And with that, I'll move over to the report from our SGO reps. Uh, sorry, FGO reps, FGO reps, uh, Katie and Noah, take it away. Good evening, and thank you for having us again. As we mentioned at the last meeting, the SGO has decided to decorate the school on special occasions in an effort to boost school spirit and morale. Last week, we decorated the school for Halloween with decorations purchased from the SGO funds. Students and staff all really enjoyed this, and we all purchased decorations that can be reused so that the SGO can redecorate this year, next year and continue this new tradition for years to come. Um, also on Friday, we had the first ever SGO sponsored Halloween costume contest. Um, we selected 15 teachers to nominate their favorite costumes from throughout the day uh, to participate in the contest. Those students were then called to the courtyard at the end of the day and were judged by uh, Dr. Curris and Dr. Mabrook. And then um, Mr. Contreras, of course, had the tie-breaking vote. We're happy to say it was a big success and a group of sophomores dressed as Gatorade bottles, um, they won. <laughs> Their prize was a basket of candy, which they were very excited about. <laughs> and then we're hoping to use the momentum of this event to create more excitement for our next events. Um, our next Planned Spirit Day is going to be a pink out day for breast cancer, which has been heavily requested by students and more specific details about this are to come. And finally, the SGO is helping to sponsor a No Place for Hate t-shirt contest, which students will have the opportunity to submit a design for a t-shirt based on No Hate. Information about this contest will be shared throughout the building in Super Commons over the coming weeks, and we are hoping to make it district-wide. Thank you all, and have a great evening. Thank you both. Can I ask, uh, did you participate in, in, the, in the costume contest? Me and my friends dressed up as nuns, but we unfortunately did not win. <laughs> Katie, did you... Uh... I was dressed up, but I was not nominated, thankfully. <laughs> I, was, I was running it, so I think that would have been a bit of a conflict of interest. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Uh, we appreciate very much you guys coming, but also know that you have busy schedules. So uh, you're certainly, uh, you're welcome to participate, but we appreciate it. And thank you for coming and you can head out if, you, if you'd like. You. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I will hand it over at this point uh, to Dr. Zublionis, who will lead a discussion of establishing our priorities for the 2022-2023 budget. Believe it or not, it is that time of year again. Uh, when we start to think about next year's budget, where uh, Board of Education starts to give us direction to set priorities uh, for the budget for next school year. And uh, these priorities really provide a framework for uh, the administration to prioritize aspects of our budget uh, and to provide the best possible experience uh, for our students to learn and to grow and thrive. Of course, we're operating within certain structures and boundaries. Um, it's important to note uh, the detail and, and the thoroughness of the process uh, within the administration and with the board. Um, with the guidance that the board gives us um, and with the district goals in mind, all North Shore administrators are then required to build what we call a zero-based budget. Basically, they don't just roll over the budget from last year, they build it from scratch with the priorities for the year ahead and with the direction from the board for the year ahead. Um, we explain the why and the reasoning behind each department and building budget. Um, we have to create uh, narratives and we share those with each other. Uh, Dr. Dolan, Ms. Boazzi and myself review those with the administrators, uh, engage in dialogue. Um, and then of course, we're obligated to work within the constraints that all new New York school districts are. Namely, um, we're bound by the New York state property tax cap, which is determined by the rate of inflation or the consumer price index. Um, and one thing that's important to note um, is that, you know, the tax cap is really regulating the tax levy to tax levy increase. It's managing uh, the amount of tax that a district can raise. It's not the budget to budget increase. 
Um, and so while they're certainly connected and interrelated, uh, the tax gap is not the budget cap. Those are two different things. Um, and it's, it's really important to know that um, within that structure as well, we have other pressures on the other side, on the, on the expense side of salaries and um, pension payments and other uh, restrictions as well that, that put pressure on the budget. So uh, with that in mind, we're uh, excited to get going and, and start the process. <laughs> okay. Um, before we turn it over to trustees, I just had a little bit of kind of background info for the folks who are, who are watching this. And of course, for the folks who are here, we appreciate you coming. Uh, I want to thank Chris. Uh, should I call you Chris, Dr. Z? Yeah. <laughs> uh, for, uh, for that explanation. And of course, focusing on uh, that 2% number, certainly in past years, but districts across New York were free to raise uh, raise taxes at any number, uh, du double digit numbers we saw not too long ago. Uh, but then one of the last, I don't know how many years it is, eight, yeah. 2012. Yeah. All right, I said eight, not, not too far. Uh, we were regulated by that, which is called the 2% tax cap. But of course that 2%, because it's driven by the com consumer price index can fluctuate. It can be as high as three or four. There's some districts that have even had negative Re required negative growth in their tax cap from one year, which of course makes it very difficult, especially because we are in the people business and something about close to 80% of our budget is tied up in our personnel as it should be. But between salary and benefits, those numbers are contractually driven and they're driven by the numbers we need to serve our student body. So there is only so much flexibility we have in that, in that document. Um, I want to, regarding this process, I know we've taken a lot of pains uh, to tie the dollars that we spend to our values and priorities as a district and as representative of the communities. Uh, Dr. Jarizzo, our previous superintendent, really reformed the budget process to some degree to make an effort specifically to tie those through the narratives that we use. And most importantly, I think, is that we really want and need the community to be engaged in this process. It's our money as a community. It's a huge amount of money, and we want to build confidence in this in this process. Uh, we're certainly aware that the budget came very close to failing last year. That's certainly something that has driven a lot of these efforts and has made, uh, just being honest, uh, us, us as a board realize we need to do a better job of communicating with the community as a whole so we can increase the awareness of what's going on. So there are certain steps that we're doing uh, specifically to do that. Uh, we are bringing people into the process in the form of Dr. Dolan's going to be hosting budget boot camps this year. We're going to be reviving budget meetings at people's homes, which is something we used to do. COVID, COVID kind of shut that down. Uh, but now instead of a budget coffee in someone's living room, a backyard budget, which uh, is a little more alliterative and hopefully can uh, can work for folks. Uh, LAC this year was charged with communicating better with the community as a whole. Tonight, we're gonna be discussing and hopefully approving the creation of an ad hoc budget committee to increase knowledge and budget awareness. We will also be working on a more long-term budget advisory committee that one of our uh, is one of our directives for, for the year as well. Uh, we've been working with parent organizations organizations to increase voter awareness, not to advocate, but we want people to know about the process, to get their information. The website has so much information, it's hard to go there, and it's dense when you do go there. Uh, so we want to try to get that information out in a better way. So as we've started this year through one of our goals of engagement, focusing on how people want to be engaged, we have a better sense of that now. And we're going to be turning the corner now to starting to act on some of those, some of those recommendations. Uh, the budget process itself, uh, it starts tonight. I shouldn't say it starts tonight at all, because the reality is budgets from the past years have five-year revenue projections and five-year expenditure projections, and so things don't exist in a single-year vacuum. But for this year, you mentioned the zero-based budgeting process, which of course is accurate, and it starts with meetings between central office and the directors and administrators and principals, uh, all different uh, people from across the community uh, and, of course, within the inter-school inter community to understand what the needs are for this next year, uh, which is which is hugely important. And then, of course, that's led by Olivia Boazzi, who was our Assistant Superintendent for Business, and Dr. Zublionis, who's our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum. And the nice thing is, though, those are two very separate areas. You both understand the roles of each other quite well. Uh, this, I'm, a, I'm as I mentioned before, I'm a business person, and sometimes numbers in business can be whatever they can be, and they can be cold. Uh, when you're in an educational system, the numbers, of course, matter, but you can't forget what that means in terms of people and children. We just spent time on our audit committee talking about lunch and the impact of 
lunch and free lunch and the type of lunch you serve and how you serve it and to whom you serve it and how you get it to them and who's the one preparing it. It's very complicated, but it's not just, it's not just numbers on a page, it's kids. And of course, you both get that. And you, of course, understand the financial piece as well. So uh, we're lucky to have your experience, and your understanding of North Shore. Tonight is the opportunity for our trustees to share with the administration our priorities for the budget going forward. And I believe I have talked enough. I will hand it over to my fellow trustees to, uh, to share your thoughts. I'm ready Andrew. to jump in. Yeah, please. So I want to start with STEM. So as we've spoken about many times at many meetings over the years, um, the elementary STEM program was originally meant to contain three STEM teachers. We have um, had two for several years. And then of course this year, we had a 0.4 that was funded by the learning loss money that we had. Um, the STEM committee, which has met regularly over the last two years, it has been their continual recommendation that the district have three STEM teachers. Um, STEM provides extensive authentic learning. In uh, what we know about COVID is that science matters. Um, children are naturally curious um, to learn more science. And there's lots of research that suggests if you're gonna become a scientist, you have to be um, engaged with science at an early age. So I hope that as we move forward this year, we can at least retain the 0.4, but I, I do think it's our district's values. And we have had so many people advocate for this third STEM teacher um, that I really hope that we're able to make room for it in this upcoming budget. As you know, each STEM teacher can provide a different aspect of STEM. Um, so it would provide not only an extra person who could provide more, um, more time in the student's schedule to provide science, but also different aspects of science. Um, the STEM extracurriculars at the elementary school level are hugely popular. They fill up. Um, often because they're so popular, the students can't have many sessions because there's not enough to go around. We have a third person that's more extracurricular activities at the elementary level for science. Um, also, the STEM committee is interested in having um, a yearly STEM fair um, or a twice a year STEM fair. If we had more funding for that, I think the, those events could be even um, attract even more community members. And then I know Dr. Dolan has been influential in making um, some partnerships between North Shore and like the cradle of aviation and more funding in science would allow for more of those field trips and partnerships and in services. Um, so more science. I also want to address special ed funding um, over I guess the last year or two, we've spoken a lot about learning loss and we've learned um, that there's been an increase in referrals to special ed, increase in classifications and therefore like increases in special ed services, um, both in terms of IEPs and 504s and also building level services. Um, so I wanna make sure that we have enough money to fund this increase in services going forward. Um, most of that will, you know, will be toward remediation, which of course is incredibly important. But I also think we need to look at some of that money being devoted to accommodation. So in most cases, deficits can be remediated, but of course they're not remediated overnight. And in the meantime, students need supports in place to help get their homework done, to help read, to help do math, um, because remediation takes time sometimes years. So I think the district needs to invest more in assisted tech funding. Um, there are devices like C-Pen readers for students with dyslexia and dysgraphia. Um, there are tons of dis different assisted technology programs and subscriptions that can be utilized. Um, and of course, we need more professional development in in this area. So last board meeting, we talked about lessons from the pandemic and, and part of what you presented on Dr. Z was this idea of digital literacy. We know from the pandemic that many students benefited from 
technology. And I think one area that we have not um, done the best job in is utilizing that technology to help children to have different kinds of learning differences. So I'd like to see some focus on accommodation as well as remediation. And then I thought a little bit about um, what could we do maybe that would be progressive. And our district, like all districts on Long Island, do not have specific services for twice exceptional learners. So for the public who might not be familiar with that term, twice exceptional learners are children, are students who are both gifted and having some type of learning disability. Um, and these students are often the students who are most neglected or forgotten um, in traditional education systems. Um, they are the most challenging to, ed uh, to educate and their needs are rarely met in a traditional classroom as well as in special education. So they have very different learning needs, um, but they also have very different psychological needs. And we know that when we fail these students, we're not only depriving these children of their unique educational needs, but we're really also depriving society of their gifts. So in thinking about it, um, I was thinking maybe North Shore could develop a program um, that is specific to twice exceptional learners. And not only would we save money in terms of out of district placement for these students um, and in terms of wasted cost on providing the wrong services to these students because we know that twice exceptional students because their educational needs are often neglected end up with behavioral problems end up in special education end up with services that are just the wrong types of services for them that we actually probably could save money and because there are no similar programs like this on long island we can be i think it could be a source of revenue for the district um, where we can serve students from other districts as well. Um, so I hope this could be something that we think about. Um, I think that um, it could be really a wonderful thing for many children on Long Island, as well as many families. The third thing that I just wanted to mention um, briefly was going back to the DASA report and make sure that in our budget, um, we have enough supervision at the schools, particularly at the middle school, where we know that there has been some lack of supervision. Um, and then also training for the people who are doing the supervising. Um, I also think that in terms of the DASA report, um, because some of the incidents occurred during uh, recess, I think we should also look at devoting some funding for um, playground equipment that would be age appropriate at the middle school level. Because I think the, the more activities students have um, during recess that are, that are available to them, I think um, that keeps them directed in productive ways. So those are my ideas. Thank you very much. I'm gonna try to mix it up left side, right side. Does someone on this side wanna go? Sure, I don't have as much to say. But <laughs> um, so, you know, when I was thinking about this, I just think that we should definitely maintain the excellent award winning school district that so many people are moving to this district for. Um, I, I think, you know, our SEOs, our small class sizes, our innovative and varied class offerings. You know, these these are the things that I think make us stand out and I just want to make sure we maintain them. Um, I, I agree with Andrea's recommendation. So I'll, I'll say that I think um, as far as professional development is concerned, like ugh, we're talking a lot, we've been talking a lot about homework and about, you know, reducing stress and improving engagement. And I went back to the challenge success survey and that was their, their biggest recommendation was, um, it said the most effective way to reduce stress and improve engagement and well being would be reducing the homework load, no homework on weekends, breaks, having teachers coordinate due dates for major project, projects and assessments, and creating more time for students to work on homework and projects in school. Obviously, this is high school, but just figuring out, you know, how we can make those kinds of things happen. Um, I also think that some of the, the class sizes in the high school seemed like, you know, 
I guess it varies from year to year, but it seems like we did have some larger class sizes this year. So something to possibly look into for next year. Um, and uh, outdoor learning. So for, you know, one of the things that we, you know, have really embraced because of COVID was outdoor learning and, and even not only outdoor learning, but ventilation, keeping our children safe. I mean, these are things that we've improved now because of COVID, but we can, you know, make sure that we carry those, carry those on. Um, and, and I agree, I, I was going to talk about special education as well, but I think Andrea covered it pretty well, but just making sure that we have the funding there for, for the, for the special education needs. Thank you. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Glover. Um, <clears throat> I, I agree with much of what was just said. I want to reiterate part of it. Um, I think it's important that we do our best to maintain and improve our programs in a fiscally responsible way. And I think part of that deals with equity to a certain extent because I, I think particularly in a high school, student, uh, students planning for the, the successive year probably occurs a little bit too late be, in terms of our budget process because when we get down to it, we're really not sure about staffing. So we're always guessing. I think if we could program the students a little bit earlier this year to have a better handle in terms of what kinds of projections we would need, that would be helpful. And in that vein, I also, you know, I think part of the issue we have, we have lots of classes that have very small enrollments. And then we have another group of classes that are bursting at the seams. I think we need to plan a little bit better. What I mean is this, you know, at, particularly at the upper end, the, the advanced classes, the honors classes, the IB classes, quite often what we're finding is we have enough students interested to push the numbers into offering two to three sections. And shortly thereafter into the year, we have some attrition and the students then leave. So now we have classes that are running with, this, let's say for example, two sections where we really could have had one. And as a result, the sections of the regents classes end up becoming you know, exceptionally large, and it becomes a scheduling nightmare. So what I think we need to do a little bit more carefully is look at parallel sections and leave some room in, my example would be an honors versus a region section, leave some room in a parallel region section for, you know, with the understanding that there's probably gonna be some movement early on in the year. And with that, in terms of projections, try and be a little bit more, I guess, aggressive in terms of, you know, kind of holding the line. Because again, we're, we, we are running some classes with a handful of kids where we maybe, if we had thought about it a little bit more and planned a little bit better, we could have, we could have done a better job. Thank you. Um, I don't want to force it. I mean, uh... Dave, I'll take a turn. Oh, okay. Okay. That sounds great, Maria. Uh -huh. Thank you. I can't tell what's going on. Oh, totally. So if it's not my turn, that's okay. No, it's absolutely your turn. I just, I just cannot see you. So I appreciate you speaking up. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you um, to those who think it's uh, that it's weird that I'm in this situation, but I can see you. <laughs> um, I also just want to, um, you know, echo the eloquence I've heard so far, but also uh, um, specifically emphasize something that Lisa mentioned, which of course is um, also one of my favorite priorities, and that is um, the promotion of continued and expanded outdoor learning. Um, I, I think it's easy for us to feel that we're doing it um, 
well and we're continuing it because we get the children outdoors for lunch and recess. But I, 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 I like to think that outdoor learning goes way beyond that and, and to um, not just play-based learning, but actual academic learning outside. And I think we have seen some uh, very effective um, uh, carrying through of that. And I, I, there are a handful of teachers trying to continue it this year. And um, I know at least one of them has spoken really beautifully about um, the advantages that it has brought to his classes, particularly in this case at the elementary level. But I think that there is, uh, given some of the things that we've addressed over the past few months, seems to me that the advantages of the of the of the of the mental health benefits of, of the children being outdoor more uh, would be a tremendous boon to some of the behavioral issues that we see. So just to very briefly, I think you know some of the 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 um, the easily ticked off advantages of outdoor learning are, as Dr. Z and Dr. Dolan pointed out in the last meeting, that it increases engagement. Um, it has been. Uh, you know, being, it has been recognized that being outdoors is one of the safest places we could possibly be in a pandemic environment. And as we've watched uh, the COVID virus morph into more and more uh, contagious forms, we, I get the sense, you know, I think it's, it's not hard to think that this type of battle uh, is going to continue possibly for a very long time. And it's a place outdoors is a place where we don't, our children don't need to be wearing their masks. Uh, it obviously promotes better mental health and wellness. Um, it broadens educational opportunities, not just through uh, you know, project-based activities, but through field trips. And I would um, add that it counteracts um, it or balances out um, the, the, the risk of too much uh, reliance on on technology, I'm, I'm definitely, I, I spent a career in technology and education and I, I certainly value it. And I think it's become a critical component of how successful we are. But I also think that um, having our children staring at screens um, too much, you know, pushes me into a, a, a place of worry. And I think um, outdoor learning provides um, a balance to that. So I would like to see us find some way uh, to keep some funds directed towards, you know, tools for making it easier uh, and more comfortable for both our students and our teachers uh, to actually be outdoors learning, having their classes outdoors, more uh, if professional development might be needed, um, certainly more um, just simple um, tools for the faculty, for our teachers to get their materials outside, to perhaps be able to store their materials outside, um, more um, seating possibilities that might have different types of um, protection available for the classes, whether it's wind breaks or larger and stronger tents that can stay up um, in a little bit worse weather than they can now without being blown away. Um, those kinds of things are, are, I think, you know, I think we've shown that we can do it. We've shown the value of it now. We've seen that in multiple presentations. The board has specified it as a, as a, as a, um, as a priority in other, in other contexts. So I'd like to see us carry that through when we're, when we're battling the, uh, the budget gods. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Appreciate that. Um... Marianne, then we'll go to Sarah. Thank you. Okay, so um, in prior meetings, people have, uh, community members have brought up the decline in the enrollment, but not a decline in the overall budget. Uh, so whether you agree with it or not, I think when there were these um, opportunities where there was low as the enrollment declined and there were dollars, they were utilized to try different things, the implementation of iPads, the introduction of elementary plus, the introduction of IB, we added some more administrators. Um, so that those kind of, uh, so those, so 
you know, uh, you have to always look at and improve your curriculum, right? So those opportunities were explored. Um, we know last year presented uh, a real challenge, even staying within the 2% cap. And we know that there was a shift in the base proportions. Um, I think we can anticipate uh, a continuing shift in the base proportions, which would give the residents um, and the businesses maybe a higher um, pro rata share of bearing the, the budget expenses. Um, so uh, looking at the most recent elections the other day, I am concerned that we have a plan in place that this budget will pass and that we've examined every detail and, and, and looked at how we allocate those funds and what has worked and what has not worked. Uh, one of the things that Trustee Galati touched upon were the low enrollment in some of the courses. Um, that's always a problem and with the continuing you know, curriculum where you don't have a lot of students, but you need it to complete. I think one of the um, unanticipated effects of the IB diploma program has been that in order to get that diploma degree, students have to take the second year of a of subjects. And sometimes the enrollment in those subjects is, is very low. Um, so you're running classes with six or seven students. So I think that is um, something we have to look at. We, um, as we introduced uh, Mandarin in the elementary schools, we brought it through the middle school and the high school. The end result is we now are offering five different languages. Not, not a bad thing, but an expensive thing, right? So I, I think we have to look at that because if you ever want to narrow that enrollment, you have to do it over a period of time. It's not something you would have to let the students who are already matriculating in that language in the high school complete that curriculum. Um, so I think that's something we um, we need to talk about um, whether it's sustainable with the cap to you know maintain five different languages. I think we have to look at the administrative structure and see if there is some room to make some changes on the administrative level and to consolidate some of those uh, positions so that more dollars go to the classroom as opposed to um, uh, structure. I mean, not that I'm not saying that everyone doesn't contribute, I'm sure they do, but um, I, I, I am very concerned that the budget will be received well by the community. I think the only way that that will happen is if it looks like we have a long-term plan as to what we are prioritizing so that as the budget um, goes to vote, that people understand that we, we've heard the concern about the increase in taxes because the dollar amount that we predicted for 100,000 would increase in taxes based upon a budget passing was not that dollar amount because of the shift in the base proportions. Um, so I don't want us falling into that trap. And I do want us to look like we're not just looking at, for, for the community to understand, because I think we understand that we are not just looking at this year, but we're looking from five years to now, because I don't want this board and future boards to be in a position where a budget fails and then we're forced to make cuts that we don't want to make rather than thinking ahead and realizing where savings and economies of scale can be achieved. Um, those are very simple ideas that I just put forth. They're really basic, I'm sure. There are other areas um, that we could look at. I do 
want to mention since special ed was brought up that we do preserve um, that assistant director of elementary special ed position that was taken out last year. I really do believe based upon the feedback that we have gotten that that should be put back in. I know we're advertising for that. So I just want to make sure that that in our budget is covered. Thank you, Trustee Russo. Uh, Vice President Jones, you're up. Thank you. Um, so I've been thinking about budget priorities in two ways. So one is the way we want the budget to reflect um, our priorities and how they shift in response to what our students really need year to year. Um, we have discussed social and emotional learning over the past couple of years, but I wanted to suggest specifically that we may possibly need a more up-to-date health curriculum, really K-12 or whether that's curriculum or whether that's professional development. Um, I think we've all heard a lot of concerns about parents in many different ways. And I think it's worth taking a look at it because there's no question that there are a number of health related issues in our district as well, whether it be substance abuse or whether it be anxiety and depression, it really runs the gamut. Um, and it's something we just can't neglect. Uh, second, we've seen really interesting data on how powerful our summer programming is. Thank you, Mr. Zublian, Dr. Zublianis. Um, and I think we really want to see that reflected in the budget. This is a hugely powerful tool to deal with learning loss, but even not just in a pandemic situation, but to combat what's very typical learning loss over a summer for many students. Um, and it's a real step forward in terms of many years ago, we had a very large summer program that we lost due to some budget cuts and stuff. And this has been great movement forward on getting us back on that point. Um, we talk a lot about the SVOs. They're a critical part of our educational program and the strategic plan. Um, and there've been a lot of conversations recently about how we're gonna educate students around the SVO that has to do with being innovators. Um, because there's apparently, it, apparently there's something very different when it comes to educating students on that prong, being innovators versus something like being, teaching students how to be better collaborators or communicators. Um, and I know we put um, some resources into professional development already. And I think this is a very challenging area. And because there's a lot of research around creativity that has to do with physical settings, that has to do with technology, that has to do with other ways of promoting innovation outside of like this very direct sort of like, this is how you do it model. I think it could need some budgetary support. I don't think it's massive, but I think it could be there. I think it possibly also leads to us looking more at um, universal design issues, because I suspect that there's an overlap with those issues and with engagement issues. I am no expert on universal design, but I know, Dr. C, you have been looking at that. And I think you might have a better sense if there's something there. Um, Given the look we did at DASA recently, I think there could be a need for some budgetary support for professional development there to make sure that we're training all the staff and not just coordinators because there are reporting requirements that impact everyone that's in a school building and to really reach everyone is a much more heavy lift. It's possible we need someone who's spending at least part of their day really focused on these diversity concerns you know, with a much more singular focus. We've heard a lot of discussion from um, the auditors. And again, that we're, we're gonna have to budget for our lunch service in the short term. It was program, there've been a lot of structural changes there um, and very significant changes to the federal program that have impacted us. And that's just, it looks like a reality of something that we're gonna have to budget for. Um, I too would love to see the third elementary school STEM teacher that we talked about years ago. We thought we really had a plan to put in one, two, three, but 
there have been a lot of challenges there. If that could happen, I think it'd be a tremendous benefit to the district. I don't doubt at all that we're gonna look very closely at our special education needs and budget very specifically and appropriately for that as we've done in the past. Um, but I do think the idea of programming around these 2E students is potentially a really interesting opportunity for those students and for the district. Um, the challenge success survey Lisa referenced, I think is interesting. And I think it could also be a professional development cost if it is in fact really hard for us to decrease the homework loads in the grades that we saw those significant spikes in for the survey. If that's hard for us to do, maybe the budget needs to support better ways to do that. The whole second way that I look at budget priorities is that we want the budget to work well financially too. We want it to find efficiencies and we want it to preserve the value of our really significant investment, right? The community has significant investment in the infrastructure and all of the things that we find in our school buildings. And I think the budget has to support that. And in doing so, we also support the effort to keep our spending level year to year by preserving that value. Um, and I think we wanna look at this in as sophisticated as a way as possible so that we stay within the cap without just having to pick sort of like winners and losers programmatically. So one way to look at it is outsourcing, but more significantly insourcing. Right, that we're going to do a very careful job. And I think I'd be surprised the board doesn't agree that we should do a very careful job at looking at where we have a lot of contracts or where we have a lot of outside services. And then it makes the sense to bring those in house if it could become more efficient. And this applies to, I think, special ed services, the substitutes, um, places maybe where we have sort of chronic overages. I think there are a lot of ways to do that to make sure what we're doing with our own staff versus what we're doing with outside staff is always done efficiently. And I think that can move in both directions. I think the second piece of this is, I think of them as capital schedules. I'm not certain it's the perfect term, but what I'm saying is I wanna make sure that any place the district has a significant investment, that we have a consistent planned replacement schedule that preserves the value of that investment and prevents wild swings in spending. So with our physical plant, which is by far the lion's share of this, we do this very effectively in a lot of ways, right? Because we have schedules that have the useful life of things like septic, septic systems, boilers, electrical panels, and the construction steering committee spends a lot of time playing those things and making sure that we're using all the resources we have to maintain them. But I think there are smaller items that also, once added together, are also important that can fall under our radar. Um, and some of these we've talked about before, like we have a pretty significant investment in physical instruments, right? There are some significant, large, expensive instruments that we need to provide if we're gonna have a robust music program. And you don't want them all to sort of decay simultaneously, right? So we've started to make some progress with musical instruments about making sure the same way you would with computers, printers, wireless network nodes, that you're replacing those on a regular basis. We started talking more recently about uh, textbook schedules too. Textbooks become out of date. We'd rather not replace them all in the same year. We'd rather have a plan for that. But I think, and other people maybe have a better sense of what these other sort of like smaller, more hidden capital schedules might be than I do. But it could be library books. It could be classroom libraries. It could be specialized art equipment, like, I don't know, digital cameras. It could be athletic equipment. It could be lab equipment. But wherever we've already made a significant investment, you want to 
preserve that value and you don't want to do it in a spiky way. Um, it's possible though that we do need, despite the fact that we've been doing a very good job with the physical plant, it's possible that we need to make some investments in the resiliency of our facilities because we're starting to see some very different weather patterns. You know, much heavier rainfalls, bigger threats of tornadoes, and that's a complicated issue. So I don't know that that's necessarily a budget issue right now. Maybe it's more of like a task force issue because it's likely to become a budget issue and a way to start planning for that. Um, I think finally, I don't think, I don't doubt we're gonna need some continued emphasis on technology, that this is going to cost us money. Um, it's an obvious area of investment and it has been for many years, but uh, obviously ransomware attacks only increase on schools and we've done a fairly good job of planning for that, but I don't doubt that will cost us more money as we continue to sort of elevate our ability to resist those. Um, but I think also we want to make sure that our, the investments we've already made in technology, I'm going to say are as accessible to us as possible. So we have Chromebooks, we have internet access. So let's make, we're going to have to continue to invest to make sure our wireless networks make all of these pieces accessible, including extending them further outside. Um, We've made progress on making sure that the many different apps that we use are easier to log into and access, but I suspect there's probably more progress that we can make there. And I think there might be some more specialized software uh, that's harder to access that some school districts use. For example, statistics software that you might use for your science research program, right? Um, some school districts have these sort of more robust portals where you can access software that resides, I'm gonna say at the school, but obviously it doesn't have to really be at the school, it could be somewhere. Um, so that you can get to all of these more specialized software programs that we've made an investment in, but you can do so from wherever you are. And I think part of the technology investment is probably also assistive tech, right? Where there's just been, such a tremendous progress in the availability and the affordability of technology that helps all different kinds of learners learn and show what they've learned. And that's really all I have, that's it, just that. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so for me, um, I talked about the engagement with the community piece. One of the, when I was first starting to pay attention to what was going on with the district. Uh, that was right around the time that the previous, previous superintendent, Dr. Ed Melnick, uh, was dealing with the specter of uh, serious contribution reductions from the LIPA plan. And he convened the superintendent's council where we had at least 200 residents come together and talk about what are we going to do if this is a eight digit loss of revenue to this district as was potentially proposed back then. Uh, and we all convened. The first thing we did was we all studied the budget. We understood how it worked. We understood the intricacies of school budgeting. And then we had around three or four sessions of what we could possibly do as sort of larger issues to address that. That's not completely analogous to where we are, although I'll get to it in a second, but it was indicative of the kind of engagement the community had in looking at the process and thinking about ways to make, um, to create efficiencies. And part of that was understanding and having a larger number of people understand the difficulties in trying to find those efficiencies that I think there's a lot of talk out there as we all feel this way about our government that people think about government as wasteful. People think about overspending, people think about taxes being too high and not getting enough for it. But I think as with most things, when you look at the details of it, it becomes a lot more cloudy and it becomes a lot more difficult because when you talk about cutting things or you talk about making things reduced from what they are right now, there's no magic bullet. There's no big fat fund of waste sitting here. We've all been sitting here, some of us for a very long time and some of us for a couple of months. But one of the findings from that group was there wasn't some big line that you could just cut. If you're cutting what goes on in the school, it's going to affect 
ultimately what happens. And so I think the more we engage the community and have them understand the choices facing us and whatever path we choose on those on that of those choices is one that people are on board with and understand what we're doing, then we as a community will be better able to make that decision together. So I think the engagement piece that I focused on earlier that we've set as a priority for the year is very much part and parcel of the budgeting process. Um, I said I would come back to this. LIPA has been a discussion since then, and it has continued to be a discussion. Right now, we all know uh, from reports and from Newsday and everywhere else that LIPA is pursuing their suit against the county, and that could very clearly affect us. We know that at some point there is likely to be some settlement that we've talked about many times. I think that has to be a priority in terms of future revenue streams. Should pause. Olivia's pencil starting to smoke from the <laughs> furiousness that's coming through. But also, I mean, this is election week. We have a new county executive. We have a what looks like a very new dynamic in the legislature. And whatever uh, terra firma we thought we were on before is not the same. And so, luckily, we have engaged and very accessible lobbyists who help us navigate that path. And we need to continue working with them to understand and as much as possible. Uh, be a part of those discussions as we were in the past, uh, even though, as we've also discussed, we are a bit of a ball of yarn in these larger entities as cat's paws. But that being said, uh, I also wanted to talk about uh, class sizes, which has been mentioned by a couple of my other trustees. Uh, I had asked from this seat a few weeks ago uh, for reports on uh, cohort changes over the years. Uh, and what we looked at specifically was from June of 21 to October of 21 to see what happens to our class sizes. Are people coming? Are people going? And what I found is that there is pretty much an average of five kids we added in every grade from kindergarten to first through 11 through 12th. Some of those years are as large as 10 or 13 we've added. Some, as of course we all know, there's a big drop off from eighth to ninth as some choose you know, some students choose to go to parochial school, uh, typically as they, they go into the high school years, but that overall we see that growth. We graduated a very large class last year, which was 238 kids. But right now the five classes before then are all at 190 or above, above 190. And if we average five more per class, we're gonna be at two tens by the time they go. And if you look further and take the total number, we're adding 63 kids from a cohort that is in kindergarten to a cohort that graduates. The current cohort is at, that entered and that graduated kindergarten, graduated kindergarten, moved out from kindergarten at 160, that would be 223. So I think in terms of the enrollment and the way people are moving to this district with kids, as we all know, uh, that is something that we're gonna have to pay very close attention to. And not just specifically for planning out our class sizes, but also it does appear, as has been mentioned as well, that many students do, many families and students do choose this district for special ed services. We know when you budget that Olivia looks at every single student and makes a plan to make sure they're accommodated, but there will be likely more students and more accommodation and more planning needed. Sarah had mentioned that potentially could create some opportunities. Uh, Andrea mentioned that as well, uh, but I think that should be a priority at understanding the growth of our students and our cohorts and the needs of those students and what we can provide for them. Uh, on smaller notes, I had listed more field trips, uh, which was certainly mentioned. Um, and that's what I got. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, trustees. Uh, I appreciate that. It's a good conversation, and we have a lot more to come. Uh, the, just in terms of the dates for the community, if you're marking your calendars now, it is on the actual uh, calendar, our board meetings, and will be listed on the website as well. Uh, but the presentation from the administration of their initial budget will be on February... Uh, do you have a date? I thought I had, oh, February 3rd. Uh, that's the initial presentation. It will be done publicly. And then we will meet uh, with the board to discuss it on, on that date a little bit, but also on the 17th of February, the 3rd of March, and there'll be a final adoption of the budget, whatever iteration it has on March 24th. At that point, the budget stops being the budget of the administration and starts being the budget of the board, which we then present to the community. And so by that point, we're going to have everyone paying attention, everyone excited, everyone knowing all the details, and we're going to have a real referendum on the facts of what's going on with this budget. Uh, and I appreciate the work of all the trustees. We will now move on to public comment. Uh, that is our podium for anyone who chooses to come and uh, speak tonight. I would like you to please just remember that you have to push the, oh, here's someone who knows very well how to use this microphone. <laughs> Hello, Lisa. Uh, uh, just please name uh, your name and town of residence and just push the button. 
speak right into the mic. Thank you. Already. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, but if you could angle it a little bit. No, just the, the How's that? That's great. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Lisa Visa, Glenn Head. Um, I just have a comment or two and a suggestion. Um, I read action item 17, which you spoke about, the establishment of the ad hoc committee for finance. And I'm happy to see that the board is continuing to follow through on the goal of engaging the community. So in this instance, it's proactively educating the community on the finer points of district budgeting and financial planning, something which I advocated for with Trustee Russo last year. Additionally, the establishment of this committee also works in concert with Dr. Dolan's budget boot camp, which is scheduled for the end of January, ahead of the more formal budget presentation. So thank you for this. Um, in that spirit, and to um, Dave's point on LIPA in your comments just now, I'd like to suggest that perhaps administration would consider constructing a financial impact presentation to the public perhaps as part of the budget boot camp, and, and also during the initial budget review sessions at Board of, the board of Ed meetings. Um, the, the financial impact presentation I would like to see focused on LIPA. The impact LIPA has had since the decommissioning, which is around, see, when did it became a big deal? 2013 on. So if we could see a year-to-year -year impact, financial impact statement as to the decrease in taxes that LIPA specifically has paid to this school district in addition to the pilots year to year up till now. And we'll have in the future, which we know is kind of uncertain as you spoke about. Um, I know much of the future is unknown, especially in the light of the leadership changes um, at the county level, but I think this would really provide greater clarity to the community ahead of the budget vote. And I think we probably see a lot less supposition on Facebook and social media and a lot of the angst that surrounds the whole budget process uh, in the spring. So I congratulate the board on following through with the budget committee and your goals of educating the community, engaging the community. And I, I really, I'm really happy to see this. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, comments from the public. Anyone is welcome to come to the podium, share your thoughts. Oh, there you go, please. Hi, Hi Tony Karen Glenhead. I just have one question for Dr. Zay. I just wanted, well, who do I address you, Dave? Yeah, you can address me. Oh, okay, I just wanted to know um, if we had any follow-up information on the curriculum program that was going on. You spoke about uh, quite a few board meetings ago. So I just wanted to know, like, are we any closer? Because like two months ago, we were like weeks away. Yeah, so the, the curriculum maps are ready. Um, I'm just for formulating the website, putting things on still, and uh, they are ready to go. I have them. Uh, anyone who has any direct requests like in the meantime certainly please email me okay and i can send you like for example and some folks have done that english seven course map social studies nine course map you know whatever um definitely i'm a bit of a perfectionist so i'll be <laughs> honest with you it's not it's really out of just making sure everything's included and okay. looks good it's so it's, we should be up and running when yeah next around. week i mean i'm okay. i'm really putting the finish i'm gonna hold you to it yeah yeah <laughs> And uh, no, I met with the directors today. Uh, we're, we're definitely um, ready to go. It, it's probably more me at this point. But again, if anybody has any questions okay. on the specific map or course, people should always feel free to, to contact. Great. Me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. That's great. Obviously, when those are up, people going to the website and getting that information, seeing what we're actually doing is, uh, is huge. Thank you. I'm glad you highlighted that. Hi, Katra Lada Glenhead. I'm sorry, just, uh, just tilt the, the little, little. Higher? Yep. Okay. Um, Thank you. Two comments. The first one regards to two comments that were made by the trustees regarding outdoor learning. And I think everybody agrees, it's great. Um, however, this week alone, I know that the middle schools be having lunch outside. And my daughter comes home complaining how cold she is. So they should wear leggings and they need sweatpants. I mean, and it's only 40, 50 degrees by the time they go out. But she mentioned that they have to eat lunch and they need a tent. So, they're, so it just gets colder that way. So I'd like to um, know if, I don't know if there's feedback, but if you can elaborate on what outdoor learning would look like, would it be heaters or, you know, if you guys have any idea on that. 
And second and most importantly, we haven't got there yet, but on action 13 on the budget today, it says um, recommended action that we agreed to have advanced cardiovascular diagnostic, which I believe is the people that we had last year for COVID testing, to um, add to their services, flu shots, booster vaccines, and any upcoming vaccines for children five to 11. Can we elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, so they were the provider who came, sorry, you're grabbing your mic. <laughs> uh, they were the provider who came last year to, uh, to offer flu shots, to offer vaccinations, et cetera. Of course, everything has to be contracted with them. There is a demand from some segments of the community, obviously not from all segments of the community, that when that vaccination is available, that they participate in that. And I will be honest, I anticipated this question, which is I'm jumping at the mic, I guess, uh, but it is in no way related to any mandate or any forcing. It is to provide the opportunity for those who are interested in having it. Uh, but we have to have a contract in place. It is a medical, quote unquote, medical procedure. Okay, so if there's an elementary child who is missing, I booster and DTP, whatever, that child won't receive it unless the parent's present. Of oh, it's absolutely voluntary. Just, okay. Just, I had to go and I went on a ski trip last year. I used it to get a test and then okay. use, their, use their facilities. Just going back to um, the funding for outdoor learning, which I think every parent would love more outdoor learning, but is there a way that as, as we're projecting the budget that we can look at the cost effective of having implementing that versus just doing away with the masks so the kids don't have to be outside we can just now that we have HEPA filters kids are getting vaccinated our numbers are dropping we're getting to herd immunity mask hopefully will be obsolete so when we're looking at outdoor learning maybe we can look at the cost effective you know should we be applying those funds somewhere else given that the budget is limited the budget is absolutely limited that's a that's a very fair takeaway from this conversation or from you know, the right. word the word budget itself because uh, it implies a, a, a limitation i think there's a couple different factors in there uh right now the masks obviously the district made decisions but the masks are currently under a mandate so that's separate from from any of that the outdoor learning has two purposes i think that we've discussed and i'm gleaning this not as an educator but as someone who's been in this chair uh the first is that yes in a COVID world it certainly is lower transmission outside that's that's what people what well that's that's just the science of it. Uh, but there's also the reality separate from anything else is that there were additional benefits. And last meeting, we talked about some of those additional benefits of being outside of students breaking it up of having things, you know, a different experience having uh, more of an inner relationship with nature and that lends itself not just in science classes, but in all kinds of parts of our curriculum to that benefit. That said, one of the lessons from the curriculum from the pandemic last year was that, yes, there's a limit to temperature. I Again, this one I'm saying as a parent of a middle schooler, I got, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know how old your kids are, but I got a letter from the assistant principal of the middle school who said, hey, we're going to be outdoors. Please. And I dropped my, I, I, my kids usually take the bus, but that day I happened to drive my kids to school and it was chilly and there were lots of kids wearing shorts. I have children who like to wear shorts at inappropriate short weather. Uh, I was once one of those children. Uh, but that request from the assistant principal is in, you know, in reflection of the fact that uh, it's fine to wear shorts if you're all going to be in a heated school, but obviously if you're outside and it's going to be in the 50s or even the high 40s, that's not going to be appropriate. That said, we did learn that there are numbers that are too low. I don't know if Chris could talk any more to this of what the specific lessons were, but there's certainly all those limitations that come from a very practical way. Yeah, I, I would just just echo that, Dave, that um you know, we, that is something that our teachers really, they, I think they want to be outside and, and that's a real, you know, um, obstacle that they come across. And, and there are some other ones as well that we're working out, but I would also echo that we do see some of the real like pedagogical growth oriented learning outcomes that come from outdoor learning that have made it a silver lining and irrespective of the, of the mask issue. Um, we want to keep doing that as in, in a way that makes sense is cost effective, but also benefits kids. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments from the public? Okay, I appreciate that. I appreciate everyone being here tonight. Um, I will move on with our uh, business agenda, starting with action item 10, which is uh, personnel items A, A through H. Is there a motion on personnel A through H? 
Thank you, Rich. Second. There a second. Thank you, Andrea. Any questions or comments on these? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye. thank you. Christine, um, uh, Dave, can I just say one thing about- um, Of course, please. We do have one uh, faculty member receiving tenure. I'm sorry, I should- I, I, My peripheral vision between- No, no. So literally a two-dimensional <laughs> screen. <laughs> No, but I, I just wanted to mention, uh, we do have one staff member who is receiving tenure kind of in an off time, um, and, and that's Miss Allison Stork, who's a, the Glenhead School psychologist, um, and uh, she'll be recognized in June with, with the other faculty members, but she joined Glenhead in 2017. She's a committed, organized, and collaborative professional who's just so involved uh, in the entire school community and district community. Um, she is so collaborative and builds really positive relationships with her faculty and with students. Um, she fits the North Shore mold and being totally committed to her own learning and uh, is an avid participant in district-wide committees in our RTI committee with Mr. Marino and I. Um, and then I also just want to mention uh, just how kind and empathetic she is with students. Um, I was in her, her um her room three weeks ago with Mr. Marino. We really got just such a great sense of how warm she is with kids and, and how she's helped kids grow and, and work through challenges. So Dr. Rufer, Dr. Dolan and I are just extremely proud to, to recommend her to you for tenure. Thank, Thank you. you. You could certainly Thank interrupt you. me anytime, but that's a great, it's a great thing to in interrupt me for. I appreciate that. That was great to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will move on to action. I'd like to lump, uh, ask for a motion on action item. 11, which is musical accompanists, uh, sorry, accompanists and action 12 together, which is disposal of inventory. Can I get a, num a motion on 11 and 12? Motion. Second. And a second. Any questions on these? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, action item 13, the aforementioned amendment to um, uh, the agreement with advanced cardiovascular diagnostics. Is there a motion? Motion. And I heard a second as well. I guess, okay, sorry. Uh, and is there a quick questions or comments? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Action 14, which is the approval of an agreement with McBride Consulting and Business Development. Is there a motion? Motion. And a second? As a second, thank you. Questions or comments? I, I have one. Do you mind? Please, of course. Um, so, I mean, so this is quite exciting with the move to um, some electric buses and, you know, the environmental advantages, I think, are particularly clear especially given sort of the air quality challenges that the, this area faces. So, and it's clear on what the cost is. Is there, do we have any sense of like how much in grants we might be looking at bringing to the district? Like what's the value of? We don't know, but what I know for a fact is that anytime I open the papers, there's more grant opportunities going all over the place. The good thing is that we have experience with this company because they work with another school district. That's why we went with them. So hopefully this will be just, just the beginning. And I can see a lot more out there. And the fact of the matter is that they want to use North Shore as the stepping stone to get into other school districts because the vendors that they work for, they work with were contract vendors. Now they are coming to, to school district. And of course, Michelle and I will be pushing them along so that we can get what we need. I don't doubt that at all. Um, and I know um, that this doesn't currently encompass um, a solar piece when it comes to charging the electric buses, but I do think that's something we should talk about the potential for in the future. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, you know, we're gonna put solar panels on this building, I do. Glen Head and the mm -hmm. middle school. So the transportation would be a very good spot. It's you know? a very good location and it Correct. wasn't eligible Correct. for the EPC for Correct. some technical reasons, but now. Yes, yes. So this is something that we'll talk about um, with him to see whether this is something that will help us with the charging station to reduce our electric bills. So we'll talk with my bright consultant about that. Great, thank you. And thank you for all the work you guys have put into this. It's really exciting. 
Sir, I'm glad you brought that up because it's obviously uh, for the public just to confirm this is an agreement to enter an agreement, sorry, a contract to enter an agreement with a consulting firm to help us apply for the grants to be able to get the money to support this, uh, this transition from uh, traditional gas buses to an electric fleet, which is, I think, pretty cool. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, we will now move on to action item 15, which is the approval of a special education consultant agreement. Vicki Klein, is there a motion? Motion. And a second? Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye. thank you. Uh, action 16, the approval of special education IEP services. Is there a motion? Did they hear a second as well? Second. Thank you. Questions or comments? I, I do actually. Please go for it. Um, so since the start of this year, I believe that as a board, we've approved about 300 IEPs. Um, and of course, as we know, IEPs are developed um, very diligently um, in collaboration with teachers, administrators, psychologists, parents, and sometimes students. Um, and of course, IEPs are legal documents that the district is mandated um, to provide those services and accommodations that are listed. And I just wanna make sure that, um, I just wanna say it, that it's not enough to approve the IEP, the IEPs must also be followed. And um, I think it's important that we keep that in mind. Thank you, Trustee McCary. You're welcome. Um, are there other questions or comments? Okay, all in favor of approving these IEPs, aye? aye. Nice. Thank you. Um, action 17, uh, as was mentioned in our public comment, this is uh, a vote to approve the establishment of an ad hoc committee for finance, the charge for which I'll just read quickly. This committee will be charged with the responsibility of developing greater awareness of the budget process through education and training on general public school budgeting processes, as well as the specific process details and challenges of North Shore schools budget in both the long and short term. This training will be provided by district staff. After completing this training, committee members would assist the board in our efforts to engage the community at large by sharing information about district finances and budgeting. Is there a motion on that action? Motion. Okay. Rich, and a sec second. Second, great. Um, any questions or comments? I have a question. Trustee so Rousseau, now yeah. that we're establishing it, how are we going to solicit members? Are we going to do the traditional send out the committee letter because I think this is a little different uh, than our traditional process. So uh, we didn't really talk about the process of getting members on. Um, is there is there going to be a limited number of people? Is it going to be an unlimited number of people? So especially if you're talking about training, right? That's staff time. Mm -hmm. I know when we talked about this at uh, the last meeting and the meeting before when it was first raised, uh, there was the question of we got such a great feedback from the community for the ones that we did post, uh, for folks who wanted to be part of our audit committee and folks who wanted to be part of our construction steering committee, uh, as well as lack our legislative action committee, and they represented I mean, they represented our community as a whole, but they had a lot of specific skills, particularly the audit folks uh, in finances. So we definitely wanted to extend an invitation to those folks. So I believe what we had discussed, and Sarah, you could probably talk about this more because it was your original proposal, uh, but the initial, the initial round would be bringing in those folks uh, and offering them the opportunity to do that since they stepped up to volunteer. And then I would imagine at least another round as well of other folks. I don't know what, what you were thinking, Sarah. No, I agree. I think we should absolutely extend um, specific invitations to the people that have already volunteered and we just didn't have room for on these committees. Um, but I think given that, you know, the training that'll take place is not one-on-one -on -one by any stretch. Um, you know, people will speak, learn, um, that we can certainly accommodate more people. And I think um, if people are interested and if they're willing to commit to the trainings that are required, then I think they should be welcome. It's scalable. Okay. But how are we going to solicit those people? I understand we're going to extend an invitation mm -hmm. to the people who already apply. Mm -hmm. How would you like By to? By what means are we going to solicit other members because we really need if yeah members, how would you like to I, I think we we could put something on the website 
we could do Absolutely. an email. Send an email. An right? email are we going to do a traditional mailing for those who don't go on our email? I think we should look at the cost, right? Because we did the mailing for the three other committees. Um, but I don't, I don't have any sense of what it is. But we, we do need to talk about that. I think this is the top. Yes. So, but if you're saying we need to look at the cost, we mm -hmm. wouldn't know that off the top of our head. I don't. I think maybe we could well, do a postcard. Might. We do a postcard because you have the mailing. You know, was here's the thing, the postcard, postcards, I have a bizarre knowledge of this because of my company. Postcards are not necessarily cheaper than like, you know, the Paper? one page flyer. It doesn't make any sense, but huh. because of the card stock and it's the post office. Well, I, I, but regardless, you're saying if there were an inexpensive way to to do it, you would like to I would do like it. to do it because the email list is not inclusive, right? Right. Yes. So not everyone has signed up for and you may have people who don't, you know, do email or don't go on right. the website. If it were prohibitive, we could still do other things like put flyers in all the public libraries and other places people congregate but you know. i i don't want to speak for anyone but i think that one of the issues that we have uh, oh, the come new, when's the next news article going? i'm so sorry that's right interrupted. well but i was saying that one of these we come across before is that there are certain folks who because their parents or because they're involved in the district or because they voluntarily chose to sign up for district emails which anyone in the community can certainly do it's on the top right hand side of the the district website northshoreschools.org but that we have a problem reaching other members of the community who aren't keyed in and a lot of those folks so uh, when we did the um the superintendent's uh the superintendent search firm meetings with the community members i think that's a great place to start and we can certainly use that same list of people who are keyed into those folks so in addition to catching our community groups and our in-school groups we would catch the civics we would catch the kiwanis we would catch local librarians catch local politicians etc to help that disseminate is, that message american, american legion, legion. Absolutely. Um, but we had physical things in libraries, we certainly should be posting those at the supermarket the way we did. But I think we should be casting a wide net. Absolutely. And I think I think there's a good I think we probably have enough time given the budget season that I don't know when the next newsletter is coming out. Right. But if we're mailing a newsletter and we can put in that, then we're mailing to everybody yep. anyway. And it's one more way to do it. Mm -hmm. So Chris, you'll make a note to make sure Shelly is, uh, the timing is. Shelly's there. Oh, she oh, hello. Oh, look at. I was looking around going. Hi, Shelly. <laughs> no note needed. Excellent. But I, I, I would like it not just to be this meeting or an email yeah. or on the website. I would like some other means of reaching out to cast a broad net. I absolutely agree. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, very important and not there's no but in addition to the fact that we did want to recognize those folks who did fill out the initial Absolutely. uh effort to, to volunteer are there other questions on the committee formation i i i hate to be annoying but i do have some issue with the first sentence okay um because it uses the word process three times um so it reads currently this committee will be charged with the responsibility of developing greater awareness of the budget process through education and training on general public school budgeting processes as well as the specific process details and challenges of the north shore budget in both the long and short term i think it needs to be fixed um i think we could say something like this committee will be charged with the responsibility of developing greater awareness of the budget process through education and training on general public school budgeting as well as north shore specific budget details and challenges okay and then um then it says this training would be provided by district staff after completing this training committee members um committee i think should be lowercase c would assist the board board should be capital b in our efforts to engage the community at large by sharing information about district capital d finances and budgeting sorry 
that's absolutely fine with me. I want to be clear. I read the charge because it was important people know what yeah. we're doing. But all we're really approving formally is the is the uh, is the approval of the formation of an ad hoc committee. So I have no problem with what you just okay. said. If we were this was a legal contract, we'd have to all see all this right. in writing. But basically, the grammatical errors that you'd like to change are not a problem. Okay. Getting rid of the word process multiple times is not a problem. So okay. I have all no right. problem going forward with that and having you just send it by email to, to you know. Is that good with everyone? Thank you, Betty. Yes, thank you in advance, Betty. Um, any other questions or comments on action item 17? Thank you, everyone, for your comments. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And I've opened too many windows, but I believe we are now old up business. to old business. Yes. Is there any old business? Um, I'll just say it looks like the majority of the board, but not every single person. Um, we can have our what we call the board retreat, which we, by which we mean an extra meeting where we receive training and we don't go anywhere but here. Um, it looks like we're looking at the morning of December 18th. Great. That's the only moment in which only one person will be missing. Okay. It's not perfect. So that's nine to 12? Yeah. It's a Saturday? Yes. Fun. Yes. I may wear shorts. <laughs> I wish you were. We're, we're, we're having it outside in the snow. Where you <laughs> for the holidays, of course. <laughs> uh, any other old business? By the way, thank you, uh, Sarah, very much. I know that was uh, that was a lot to wrangle. Appreciate it. <laughs> no, that, that was a good time. Okay, yeah. we started we started last week in September, but we're, we we got there. Thank you. Like, that's going to be um, harder than the superintendent's search. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say it's also probably old business that I think we should have a policy committee meeting. I know we've had a lot going on, but I'm going to just put that out there to keep it on everybody's radar. Um, and I think to some extent, the cameras on um, school buses for the stop arm issue is old business. And I understand the county is still negotiating with school districts, um, but the data that came out on what happened in Suffolk when they did this, so Suffolk did it on most, but not all buses starting in May. Um, since May, it's brought in for the county and for the company that runs it, not the schools, it's brought in like $3 million, which means it's probably like caught 12,000 cars running past stopped school buses. Um, and the good news about it was they said only about, they said 90% of them were like, did it, were first time offenders and it didn't happen again apparently you only need to get one ticket in the mail for 250 dollars before you decide to start stopping for school buses um so i think there's a lot of both concerning but interesting and news and, and reasons to support you know the cameras on the school buses um but it is really striking to me that schools aren't getting any part of that revenue stream and Nassau hasn't finished negotiating with school districts so i'm not sure that the formula has to be the same as what it is in suffolk in suffolk the company that runs it and there has to be a company that runs it because of privacy concerns in the trace with the police department etc cetera, etc cetera. the company that runs it gets 45 percent of the revenue and the county of suffolk gets 55 percent and they think by the end of the year that they're looking at 10 million dollars um Safety wise, I think we want it, but I'm very curious as, if there's a way to negotiate any part of the revenue given the fact that it, you know, it is something that we have to schedule and deal with and integrate into our bus depot's functions for the installation, the maintenance, et cetera, of the cameras. Excuse me, Dave, Sarah? Yes, Maria. Yes. Um, I'm wondering that. Uh, I, that sounds like a um, a task for the legislative action committee, possibly. I think so, but I think we could probably start just by asking our lobbyists and see if there's been any larger right. movement on that's, it. That's what I was going to suggest. Probably, okay. yeah. Like a BHC. Yeah. Yep. I also just wanted to add that um, I think the policy committee meeting is a great idea since I yeah. here for that one too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and speaking of BHC, we were looking for an update from them. Did we receive it? Yeah. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. it was there. It was there? Okay. 
Any other uh, old, old business? Trustee I, McGarry? Um, I just wanted to ask Dr. Z, I wanted to follow up. You had spoken, Dr. Z, you had spoken about that you were meeting with um, some of the leaders to discuss the homework policy. Yes. And I was just curious could talk a little bit more about the update sure. we, as you know we did get another email this week about yes homework. yeah and we actually did ask dr dolan asked that parrot if we could kind of share the sentiment of the email because it was very well thought out and very helpful um i think one thing we're realizing especially when we synthesize the challenge success data and the other data that we have from the original homework um, task force mm -hmm. is the interdependence between homework homework amounts schoolwork amounts and student engagement there's there's uh, a lot of interdependence there and so what mr darney and i are going to be doing is meeting with each principal and their team to talk about engagement in their building and homework will be a central issue in each of our meetings um we did we did speak about it in our large group leadership meeting and we are going to look relook at the homework uh, task force data and presentation, which is just so well done, as well as challenge success. I think one thing we're going to determine in those meetings, uh, as per the, the more like actionable piece of the engagement goal that we've been talking about is what are those concrete steps that we can start taking this year? Um, what are the challenges to those steps? Um, and um, what might we already be doing that we can leverage? The one piece that uh, we also want to do is we have so much data, I know we've talked about that, but also we are due for a tri-states revisit in March. And so what I, what Mr. Doherty and Dr. Dole and I have talked about this is, and I'll present this more in full to you, is perhaps some of those initial action steps is something that tri-states could give us feedback on, not more data that we already have, mm -hmm. but, and that would kind of put the pressure on us as a system to take those those action right. steps as well because we're going to have to present them in an authentic way to to that audience so those meetings should happen just to go back to that original point the next two to three weeks um and uh then i'll report back 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 to you all on what we found and, and what we're um looking for uh, in terms of what might be different to particular schools, but also what's the common link. Right. I feel like my involvement and Mr. Doherty is good in that we work in every building and we know every administrator, so we can really make sure that we're not going off in too many different directions. Right. I was like right. thinking, can I just finish that? Yeah, yeah I, I was thinking more about it since our last meeting and I was thinking about how the homework and the testing too, yes. um, and how that the testing connects to authentic assessment, right? Like if we are testing as our main form of assessment, then we're really not doing authentic assessment. And the more that we test, the less time for teaching, right? Like if you have a teacher giving a test, right? And let's say you have a sixth grader and they have four tests during the week, that's a significant amount of time that teaching is not taking place. Versus where if you're using authentic assessment, right? There's there is more um, integration of teaching and learning happening during that class period. Yeah. Um, and I guess I do worry, we've spoken about this for so many years, I do worry that as the adults try to figure out a solution, the children are still suffering every day with the demands and pressure. And again, while homework has always existed, particularly now during this time of COVID where we know there is a mental health crisis, right? They are suffering more in other ways. And I just don't want to waste more time. Yeah. I think um, there's homework due tomorrow, Dr. Z. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, and um, I, I, it's such a good point about authentic assessment as learning. In fact, that's, that's what it's referred to often as assessment and uh, learning or assessment as learning. Um, and I do believe that we have to have that discussion with, with our whole school community about what are the obstacles. I do think, you know, for our faculty, you know, they want assurances from us as the school leaders that everything's going to be okay if we ask you to do this. So we have to work with them and instill that confidence in them as well. Um, and so those, those meetings will be the beginning of those discussions. Oh, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to follow up on that to say that, um, so I think that all circles back to the budget conversation, right? Like if there's supports or something we need to put in place there. But um, I also just wanted to say, I thought your comment about the shift in what tri-states could look at with regard to actual steps was, was really interesting. Thank you. Lisa? 
I was just going to reiterate what Andrew was saying. And, and I guess my biggest concern about the homework, and I know you, you already know this, is that these children in middle school, and we keep hearing from these parents, so they're doing hours of homework a night where, you know, technically the policy says 45 minutes. So I'm just wondering if there's something we can do in the meantime. I love all of your ideas, and I love that you're having these discussions, and I know they're you know, they're necessary and, and great ones, but I'm just wondering if there's something we could do to alleviate, you know, anything in the, in, in the meantime to try to, you know, I think that maybe the teachers don't realize, like, you know, the, if they're giving this much homework and other teachers giving this much homework, especially in middle school where they're coming from fifth grade where they just had one teacher for the whole day, for the most part, giving homework, and now they're going to this, you know, this new place where they have homework in every class. And if the teachers aren't coordinating, um, you know, that's obviously part of the problem. So I'm just wondering if there's something that can be done in the in the interim. Don't, don't they have the middle school? I thought it was better at the middle school in terms of coordination because they work in teams yeah. and they have team meetings. Isn't that part of the discussion about when the testing is and what the assignments are and who's struggling and who isn't struggling. I, I, I thought we had built into their schedule yes. team time. Yes, we do. And I, and I think so it's like, it's all relative to what you're comparing to like with the, so you have this structural part of elementary school where I feel like the homework is less of an issue and, and that has probably adopted to adapted to the new policy they did. more they quickly. Did. They've done a good job. Whereas yeah. then the grammar of secondary schooling is more driven towards homework naturally. And so that's where we have to deconstruct that. And I think though, what trustee Russo is saying is, is accurate that the, the teaming, um, the uh, and how they organize testing at the middle school. I make they don't they kind of have testing days informally. They don't test on scene because they have the communication structure. And then high school, it's the coordination just so difficult. It's and that wild, wild west. and they work in silos in right? the face of the new policy. And that's a common thing in, in high school. So that's where I think there's different type of work we need to do at that level to communicate and coordinate and and again reassure our faculty that they're going to be okay. We're not you know they're not going to be penalized if we're asking them to do this. And, and I think there's a lot of the same belief there. We just have to make it manageable for them. Um, so I, I do hear what you're saying about the urgency of, of the issue. And I know that Dr. Dolan and I want, want to have separate conversations about some of what we've been hearing, some of the emails we've been getting as well. So that, that will happen in parallel fashion. So we uh, just, in terms of, again, for the, for the, for the community, we had, a, um, we had a homework committee that got together uh two years ago oh, year and a half ago maybe three, three years, years ago. oh my gosh three years, three years ago uh and came together with certain recommendations the board adopted a version of those recommendations uh and now i think it's probably because this is coming up and it's been an issue i think it's worth sort of getting some feedback from the administration on the adherence to that policy to, to start i know the 18th we have a uh, we have a report on student achievement that's not too long from now but it might be worth trying to get some kind of update on what the administration has learned about the adherence to the policy as it is. So we learn better if it's episodic, if your feedback tells you that the policy we've constructed may not be feasible, or if the faculty feel like this is something that is untenable adherence to this, I'd like to hear from the faculty too. Um, that's an important piece of this. So I don't know if the 18th is too soon, but you'll talk about it you'll think about it and hopefully it can it can work. So I think though, Dave, yeah. it's worth noting that when the policy was implemented, there mm -hmm. were certain trustees, I believe Trustee Madden, Trustee Galati. I'm sorry, Mary, just get a little, a little closer. I believe Thank at you. the time we adopted the policy that Trustee Madden, Trustee Galati, Trustee Visa and, and I all expressed concern about the limitations at the high school level. Um, first of all, every student has a different schedule at the high school. It's not like at the middle school where they're in teams and they're all, there are variations in the schedule, but not to the extent there is in the high school. Uh, the second thing is when you're putting your child, selecting your child to go into honors courses and AP courses, the expectations in that policy of an hour or an hour and a half for homework are just unrealistic. Um, 
it's just not happening. And if you don't want your child to have that kind of homework, don't put them in all honest courses or AP courses. I mean, that's really just the bottom line. When they go to college, they're going to have to learn how to manage their homework. Um, and they should have those skills developed in high school. So I think, um, I think there are ways you could make it better. We talked about maybe having testing days. We talked about maybe having better communication at the high school. Uh, but if you're going to bring this up again, I think we do have the mechanisms in place to address those issues at the middle school. Um, the high school, it's going to be, I think, very, very difficult to in, enforce that policy and have children be successful because at the end of the day, when they're in high school, even in eighth grade of middle school, they have to take New York State Regents, they have to take AP exams, they have to take IB exams, they have to take SATs, they have to take ACTs. And in order to be successful in high school, and have entrance into appropriate colleges for those students, they need to be successful. And they cannot do that if you're tying the hands of the teacher with how to prepare those children for those standardized testing. And it may not be the way people would like it, but that's honestly the way the world works. I so appreciate, me, oh, 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 hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on everyone. I appreciate you supporting my point about the teacher's involvement needing to be there. And I remember those conversations and I remember that it was an outgrowth of that. Uh, Trustee Madden, who in addition to having the experience in the school was also a teacher himself, gave some proposals of what he thought could work better and they were not part of that. But I also think that what we're bringing up here uh, or what Trustee uh, McCary and, uh, and Vice President Jones and Lisa have brought up as well, I want to put the titles, the first names, whatever, uh, is more at the younger levels. And because that was an area that the policy did kind of address where we tied certain numbers and quantity of reading to the experience. But certainly at the higher levels agreed, we were not able to come up with a policy that was gonna uh, address that. The reality is if you're gonna be an IB candidate student, you better get ready to, do a lot of homework. And that's and a choice that you make versus in middle school where you don't have that choice, right? So, and yeah. the policy does specify a difference between AP and IB um, classes. Sir? I was gonna say, like, I'm clear on what it takes to be successful in high school, but the emails that we were getting recently that we were referring to were about the middle school. And what was interesting about them was that they absolutely echoed the data that we got from the homework task force, which very clearly documented that we got a big spike in homework in sixth grade, not just over fifth grade, but higher than seventh and eighth grade also, which made it look anomalous and harder to support. You see a spike again in ninth grade, and that right sort of felt like a different piece. So I think that's yeah. what we're trying to get at. Not that, so, it all, not that it all doesn't count, but you know, ninth grade does count in a somewhat different way. Yes. Specifically, sixth grade was 165 minutes based upon challenge success. Yeah. So I think that's I think that specifically is is worth looking at. The larger issue of how we manage the late lar la larger grades. I think it's a very important discussion, but it's beyond the scope. I mean, that would have to be a goal for the year, which- No, no, yeah, but yeah. all I'm saying is when we revisit it, mm -hmm. I just, I don't want, I want the focus to be on the middle school because we have the mechanism That's in place. Perfect. Yeah. And so, I do agree yeah. that in sixth grade, it seems like they get yeah. more homework, at least right. no when my kids were there mm -hmm. than in seventh and eighth grade. And that was specifically not the, the, the but, sixth, but, sixth, but, sixth grade, but the way they're sort of separate part of the building right. that is sort of a, supposed to be a transition year but instead, it's been this, it's been a, uh, it's been a polar bear plunge shock to the system. For and me. It, but Marion, I also don't want to give up on your idea of the testing schedule, because I know for years that you have mentioned that for the high school as a, as a potential solution. And, you know, I don't want to forget about that. Either. I agree. It's not, I definitely don't want to forget about it. In terms of the feasibility, it, yeah. though, I yeah. think if we, yeah. what I would suggest is we bullet pointed under old business for next time, okay. get some serious feedback on what's happening in sixth grade. Um, if you have an opportunity to meet with the K through five building leaders, I think that's you, who you mentioned. We'll certainly be happy to hear that as well. Um, and then we'll go from there. Obviously that's our next meeting. So, sure. and it's know. easy, I think, Chris, to, to, because all the homework was posted digitally, right? All you have to do is just pull it up and it's all there from all the weeks since the start of school. Yeah. yeah it's 
the other piece though, this more of the qualitative piece of how right. long it takes and, and things yes. like that. Right. And, yes. and that explains a lot of the, the high school piece right. as well. We had a great conversation with some of our seniors yeah. on the wellness committee about, you know, there's the homework time that you do. And then for, for some of those students, then they want studying time. That studying yeah. time could be three, four hours, you know, so and that's it's, what they it's had very asked dynamic. For. Yeah. They had asked mm -hmm. for want more time to study, less time. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad you brought it up. That letter was not the only one we've received, but it was particularly a particularly thoughtful letter. I think the, the, the follow-up to that letter also, which is important in terms of the immediacy of this, is when the parent came back, you know, Dr. Dolan, I'm not talking at a school, said, would it be okay if we communicated with the building leader, Miss Imperial, about this experience? And the parents said, absolutely. And by the way, I wish I had gone to her first. Yeah. That in general, if there are immediate problems with anyone and their students learning, the building leader is certainly a good, a good place to start. So I think that that's worth, worth mentioning as well. Yes. But I would also say, given the preponderance of that experience that we've heard, it's worth a deeper look than just referring people back. It's not just a pig and a poke. Okay, other old business. Um, also, the I wanted to follow up on the middle school supervision issue. I know from the DASA report, we had talked about um, addressing that. We, um, so, you know, last year versus this year, you know, there, there are still needs, but not as dramatic as last okay. year, given the, the more of a normal schedule that we're running this year at the middle school. Um, Miss Imperial, you know, did request additional aids. Um, we do have that now um i can give you more detailed information on you know anything that that they are still you know concerned about or other needs that they have but for the most part we do feel like the st staffing there has stabilized um she was extremely proactive in august um with mr nelson about what they needed uh, meeting with olivia meeting with me and, and dr dolan and um I, we do feel that it's definitely improved versus last year and i, I do think a lot of those unique pieces of last year with the cohorting and that uh, made it made it very challenging. But I, I will definitely get more specifics on that and a, and a status update. Okay. Other old business, thank you. Other old business? Is there any new business? I mean, I'm extremely happy with Dr. Dolan being here, but we seem like we're getting out of a meeting here at 940. So, uh, <laughs> That's not bad. I appreciate everyone being here and participating and watching and, and you know, we, we love members of, of the community being here, but at this point I will ask for a motion to adjourn. There we go. Thank you. Everyone.